Hey, welcome to Barn Blog. And today I'm talking uh, to Dave of Nightmare Masterclass. Uh, Dave, would you like to um, introduce your channel? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I have a channel called Nightmare Masterclass. Um, uh, talk about horror. I analyze uh, weird stuff on the internet and uh, horror movies. And my channel is kind of undergoing a an identity crisis right now because I'm a bit burned out on that stuff. So I've been streaming a little bit more. Um, yeah. Check it out. Yeah. Um, so to go into what one of the interesting things I've I've actually been following you for about a year, um, which is interesting, right? Because I um, I realized that we were Twitter friends once, and I was like, oh, that's that's that Dave or that Nightmare Masterclass that I watch on YouTube sometimes. Um, because I'm always you know what probably happened is, uh, I, uh, I got one, I got banned on one, one of my accounts. Cause I just like lost my shit at somebody who is, uh, in hindsight, this seems so dumb. Uh, <laughs> I lost my shit at somebody who was like happy that Bernie Sanders had a coronary incident. Someone was happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. Someone was, uh, you know, it was a reactionary person trying to, just oh, okay. trying to troll me. Oh, well, I mean. That, well, I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole. I talked to you off air about how, like, when I interviewed um, uh, the people from the Hara Vanguard, and I've also heard, uh, I forget their 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 formal names, but the faculty of horror professors who approach things from a feminist limb talk about, you know, whether or not horror is an inherently reactionary genre. Mm -hmm. Um but I will say that two two things where if you're a left wing um, or even a left adjacent kind of uh, thinker and and you have a political fans where it's going to show up where you're going to get a lot of reactionary pushback is going to be horror commentary in specific. Oh, totally. Um, and history which of course is the two things like sure. are, are my two pastimes and you know kind of my two hobbies um i talked to uh a cipher of um um uh, the cynical historian and similar although cipher um definitely codes his politics a lot more um i mean yes if you know what you're looking for you know he's vaguely left adjacent but if you don't you could you have plausible deniability about that. I gave up on that a long time ago. Yeah. I, I saw that you added yourself as a communist. Now it's like, aha. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I was, I was uh, quoting Marx in, uh, you know, 20, 2018. So mm -hmm. you probably would have caught it then. Yeah. Um, one of the things I enjoyed, though, that, that you've live streamed recently was your takedown of Internet debates. And I actually do want to talk to you a little bit that, about that, even though we didn't talk about talking about it before we get into our actual oh, sure. subject yeah. today. Um, I also think Internet debating is stupid. Um, <laughs> um, More often than not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are ways to do it where you can. Where you can kind of. Uh, play it in a way where you can get something out of it. And I, I mentioned on Twitter that my handle towards it is to concede like 80% of my opponent's argument immediately and then tease them into bringing out my, my criticisms themselves by, by sort of not so much baiting, but just asking questions. Yeah. Um, you debate cool people though. Yeah, well, I don't. I wouldn't debate anyone who I didn't. Who's I wouldn't debate anyone whose message I wouldn't want to spread. That's my first rule. Um, I think that's a good rule of thumb. Yeah, like so. I don't like. Like I wouldn't say I wouldn't debate a conservative or a reactionary because there would be conservatives and reactionaries. I think would have interesting things to say actually. But if I didn't think they had any, if I just like, I wouldn't debate Stefan Molyneux, for example. Like I, he's like. Right. Well, you know, and I come out of the reactionary reactionary movie myself. I watched when that debate happened between Matt McManus, uh, Matt McManus, and um, then Doug Lane, and like rolled my eyes 
hard because because it, it was it was taking it was just taking bait actually like like they they gave bait to him um and i i think that's a waste of time um i know some people build good careers off it my I mean, ben burgess is a like a friend of mine going back all the way to us both being in korea at the end of the oh, um aughts, aught teens yeah back before ben was uh you know writing for jacobin and back before i worked with zero um yeah. We we came to know each other through Doug Lane um, on the internet and then in person. But like we've been friends for a long time. But Ben's attitude towards this is almost the opposite of mine. Right. Like he'll debate anyone, and I'm always just like, "Why you guys don't you don't even share like you don't agree on enough axioms to like you really begin a conversation? Just talk past one another. Yeah, <laughs> unless you're just gonna, you know, argue about semantics the entire time. I mean, yeah, and, and and Ben's, you know, as a trained analytic philosopher, he can, he generally, I, I will give him this, he generally doesn't, um, but his best debates are with people who are close to him, too, so it's just like, you have to share enough of a worldview for the, for the differences to be meaningful, right, but that doesn't attract a, a huge audience on YouTube, I don't think. Generally not, I mean, maybe um, we can arrange a debate and just start just figure out some insults mm -hmm. start insulting one another i kind of said towards the end of my uh of that video that i'm kind of like a online debate accelerationist like i wanted to get more like pro wrestling because at least then it would be entertaining well i mean you know um i guess i guess we want to undo the legacy of john stewart when he ended crosstalk um I, that that reference is <laughs> over my head <laughs> oh, jo Jonathan, Jonathan. Okay. Jay yeah. Stu. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. that. I was in high school when that came out and that clip <laughs> just made my day. I, I was yeah. a, uh, you know, an anti-war lib at the time. And, uh, mm. oh man, that takes me back. Um, I was an anti-war paleo conservative at the time. And I also appreciated it. Although, that was back when everybody thought Tucker Carlson, and I know people don't believe this now, was the reasonable conservative. Um, go back and watch stuff from the mid aughts. It's it's very strange because like he would be invited to be like the one person Robert Alterman would talk to on the right because he agrees that the Iraq War is bad, and like it's it's a very his career has has a. Uh, I think people should be wary of reasonable conservatives. Oh, absolutely. You don't know what their actual assumptions are until the political context that makes them seem reasonable changes. Right. Um, All I remember is he had a bow tie. Oh, man. I miss. Do you, do you trust people in bow ties, Dave? No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I had I had to wear one uh, when I was an usher. So if you have to wear one for work, obviously, that's not your fault. But. In any other context, of course not. I mean, I, I actually kind of enjoy wearing the bourgeois noose, but not not the bow version. Um, right. <laughs> so um, I, I wanted to talk to pick your brain a little bit on folk horror documentaries and then whatever kind of emerges naturally. Um, uh, maybe we can even talk about like the, the kind of structural imperatives of being a YouTuber these days. Um, but I uh, have like horror is my favorite um, filmic genre. It may not be my favorite genre when you include all kinds of narrative, but it is in film. Um, and uh, I have wondered about um, the trends we see in horror because I think more than um because horror differentiated itself as a genre so quickly and then as and then it differentiated into subgenres fairly quickly and wait like when we talk about for example science fiction subgenres yes they are you can kind of identify them like hard sci-fi near future sci-fi cyberpunk mm -hmm. but they're much more nebulous than a lot of the horror genres where like no we got a vampire 
and this is what vampires do. Um, and there's been a lot of studies on like the cycles of popularity of horror genres. And um, recently, I think because of this, um, a trend in a word I find uh, of, of, of a subgenre I find kind of insulting. The way that like saying your work is speculative fiction and not fantasy or sci-fi is insulting. You know, like oh, you have an MFA and don't want to own up to it. But like <laughs> elevated horror. Um, right. Um, Very loaded term. Yeah, super loaded term. Um, uh, has been, you know, kind of popping on the scene, and you've seen it being particularly attached to a resurgence in um, occult and folk car. Um, totally. And I noticed that it really started probably just before Trump. Um, um, yeah, like The Witch came out in 2015. Mm -hmm. You think The Witch, there's, there are some, uh, um, I'm trying to think of some other movies that are in a similar vein. Um, the Witch came out then, I, I, I think there are full color elements to like the, the Jordan Peele movies. I know I wouldn't call them truly speaking full car, but there's like the whole like hidden occult, like, yeah secret world um where n normal people are terrifying and but you know but also somewhat sympathetic element to to the both the jordan uh the the jordan peele horror movies um get out uh get uh, get out on us but like um it would be hard to say that this was a reaction to trump because it predates it um right I also find it interesting that, um, that when you talk about like reactionary horror movies and like slashers, you know, even when the slasher is a, a clear um, left liberal, I think about Wes Clavin, who is clearly a left liberal, like the values that undergo a lot of those movies get read as, you know, conforming for the st status quo, the promiscuous, uh, promiscuous are killed. Right. And, um, um, are you have like revenge movies like Last House on the Left, which seem to be very, you know, revanchist, even though that's not Wes Craven's deal, but that's still what the form of the movie does. It does seem to me like when you look at, uh, progressive critiques of, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm using this loosely, like a vaguely leftoid sense of the, of the word. The two genres that often get invoked are folk horror and zombie movies. No, zombie movies is obvious. I think some of that's just like an accident of Romero's own politics. Um, and if you've ever it's, seen the critique of consumerism, yeah, the critique of consumerism. He also like had a nascent feminism in there. Um, uh, um, if you've seen uh, Season of the Witch, his uh, 70s witch movie that's kind of wild about a housewife awakening and, you know, engaging in uh, swinging and then shooting her husband and joining an occult. <laughs> um, I haven't seen that. That sounds really fun. It's 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 crazy. You could tell it was originally um, kind of supposed to be softcore porn and then Romero made it into a real movie. Um, but Romero's non-zombie movies, um, particularly the ones he made in the 70s, are kind of totally forgotten. But they're interesting. Um, so, but I have a theory, like, with zombie movies, I think it's always a little bit obvious because there's a critique of consumerism. There's a critique of mindless Americanism. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on with, like colonialism usually in zombie in zombie films and particularly if you look at the italian takes on the american zombie movie um i mean like you know um fulci has literal like undead luchadors yeah you know, like i mean not luchadors um matadors mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> it'd be funnier if it had undead luchadors that'd be cool yeah that's, that's, but, that sounds like a good movie too um but but so but folk car is interesting because there's this idea in folk car that the reaction to modern alienation is legitimate, 
but that trying to go back is, is either just as alienating or outright horrific. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I talked to you um, before this, but America doesn't really have a tradition of clean full car until this resurgence, actually. Right. Most of it's European, um, specifically British and, and German. Um, but I do think both Southern Gothic and uh, and Hicksploitation, i.e. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, are clear analogous genres in the United States, Definitely. and they have similar themes. So why do you think um, folk horror has not just become like resurgent, but also tied to this elevated horror genre all of a sudden? Like, what's your opinion on why that might happen? Uh, it, it might help to just contextualize it in the, the framework of like, you know, Midsummer, for instance, as we were saying, um, you pointed out before, highly derivative of Wicker Man. Mm -hmm. Um, still a, a cinematic experience in its own right, but shot very differently from Wicker Man. I mean, Wicker Man's like shot almost deliberately cheaply and mm -hmm. Midsommar's clearly not, but yeah. Um, you have this aspect of an insular cultish community, vague pagan motif. Um, they have their own weird customs, which get progressively more and more disconcerting. There is a protagonist that is uh, typically kind of ignorant, kind of a dick about their culture to begin with. Um, I think part of it is uh, that that sort of premise is inherently uh, it, it inherently instills you to kind of uh, reflect about the way society is arranged, uh, for starters. And then, like you were saying, uh, the, the fact that um, the fact that the cults usually end up killing everybody um, give, gives the impression that, yes, it's uh, it's probably not a good idea to romanticize the past because the past is indeed filled with untold, unspeakable horrors. And uh, and so uh, where does that leave us, you know? And it's an open-ended question. Yeah. I, I, one thing I think is interesting about Midsommar and, uh, and The Wicker Man, um, and they, this they're actually different on, but that if you listen to them, they're both Reconstructionist pagan communities. So it's different than when you find, because there are occult horrors, like court horror movies, where you're tripping on um, something that's, you know, existed for thousands of years or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But when you, in Midsommar, that community is intentionally rebuilt, appropriating, you know, anthropological work, actually, even to reconstruct its history. And in, um, if, if you remember the, the Lord um, of Somerset, long speech in the middle of the wicker man where he goes through like how his grandfather was actually an enlightenment thinker but was just trying to figure out ways to get people to work to cultivate this land better and to experiment with these new cultivars he was training so he like goes and you know digs up this like uh late victorian um pseudo anthropology on paganism and invents a whole cloth but three generations down you don't know if um, Lord, not Lord Somerset, it's Lord Summer Isle actually even mm -hmm. um, if he believes it or not, like it, he is unclear whether or not he's cynical about it. Um, but there's a deliberate, like it was deliberately reconstructed in crisis in both cases. And Midsommar goes way further with this, where like they're deliberately picking up people who will invest into this community because they're emotionally damaged um, right. and they're orphans and they have major family tragedy in the past and thus are receptive to, you know, all this, um, all these community needs. And there's also the, the um, influence of drugs everywhere, which is also, also like a common theme in folk horror, but it's not in the Wicker Man. Um, 
I do appreciate the um, I forget what the guy's name, the guy uh, who is uh, from the village, but with the group uh, that kind of lures them there. I appreciate that there's a sort of uh, a custom um, akin to it. Is this something that the Mormons do or the um, the Amish, I, I think, where they have, you know, younger people go out into the world and sort of experience life? But then Midsummer sort of twists that custom and it's it seems like it's all an elaborate farce just to, you know, attract more people into their community or at the very least, um, maybe people they would deem desirable. Yeah. Um, uh, I think there's yeah, I think there is a lot of that. Um, yeah, I actually there, there, what's interesting is how many different um, like marginal community traditions so you have all the ones that are indigenous to sweden but there's hints of like yeah like uh the whole amish uh bucks purse not you go out into the world but on like right. the amish we're also recruiting new people by doing this because otherwise we wouldn't be able to maintain our numbers um because you know everybody's got to die at a certain age and <laughs> um that's rigidly enforced via cliff jump um but it is interesting where like so many of these movies serve as an auto critique of, of like, you know, a romantic, a romantic response to modern alienation while also saying that the modern alienation is legitimate. Like that, that is a problem. Yes. You know, the Midsummer boyfriend really, is terrible. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and Midsummer literally begins with a murder suicide. And right. can, of course, you know, there's, I, I do think it it kind of encourages a sort of introspection about, yeah, is there something about the way we're currently living that maybe leads to a rise in that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And one of the, uh, since um, we, do, we are having comments in the chat, so somebody brought up that there is a lot of influence with a lot of the ghost horror um, from the 1990s uh, from Japan at first and then Korea. Um, and the ghost traditions being highly tied into East Asian Buddhist culture um, in specific, actually, um, uh, meant that there was a lot of folk horror influence um, coming through what we would have termed as J-horror, um, you know, and Korean horror. Uh, I think about in the 90s to the aughts. And so in the 90s, it's mostly Japanese. In the aughts, you have this shift, you know, kind of actually as the economy kind of got better in Korea um, into uh, uh, Korean versions. And a lot of directors that we know from like art house films got their start in kind of art house horror. I mean, you think of um, Gwe Mul, or uh, what's it in English? The Host, um, mm -hmm. as an example of this, where, where that's got elements of folk horror, elements of mon of just big monster movies and like sure. kaiju movies, elements of of um, espionage as a critique of U.S. imperialism implicit in it. Like, you know, that comes over here, and then you have stuff like um, like a uh, Ringu, which would strike us as a ghost film. Um, and one of the things I think we can get into because the line gets blurry in some of these, and a lot of folk horror. Um, the, there is a plausible deniability that anything supernatural is going on. This is true in Midsummer. Um, there isn't anything supernatural going on that we can tell in um, in The Wicker Man. Um, Witchfinder General, that like is considered like the founder. The the you know after The Wicker Man, it's like the foundation text, so to speak, for folk horror. Everybody who's awful in that movie is a person, <laughs> like. But then have you have seen uh, the movie um, it's Oni Oni Baba. Yes. Yeah, I f I feel like I actually just watched that one recently because when you said you wanted to talk about folk horror, I was like, that mm -hmm. seems like a good one to brush up on. And uh, I'm still kind of uh, yeah, I'm on the fence about whether there's anything supernatural going on in that movie. I mean, the mask gets stuck to their face, so I guess yeah. there's that. Um, but whether or not you know the the it is actually demonic or psychological is right. Um, 
always a big, I mean, even in the witch, right? Like you think about the witch where there clearly seems to be a witch at the end. There's plausible deniability, A, because Edgar sets us up as a folk tale in the first right. place. And B, like that the actual moments of true supernatural stuff that you witness are in moments of hysteria after everybody's already dead. Um, mm -hmm. Where there's a, 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 until the very last scene, if you think the very last scene is actually happening, there's plausible deniability. There's anything supernatural going on. But that's not always true in folk horror. There are, there's clearly folk horror that involves ghosts. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of ghost stories. Um, I think about, for example, um, so many MR James, you know, stories that get made by bbc into christmas horror movies mm -hmm. um do you count them as ghost stories or you count them as folk horror sometimes they're both sometimes it's hard to tell the difference um so i mean i guess that's one of the things with these subgenres. like folk car is one of the ones that's like really 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 hard to parse out ex exact parameters um I think of another, the, was it the, not the abomination, um, the hunt it came out on Netflix recently <laughs> um, where it actually has um, uh, a um, Norse um, giant demon as the folk horror element. But until you actually encounter it at the end of the film, and it's very much real, it could, it meets the criterion of folk horror. Um, what's it called? Um, so there's there's a lot of these that are in a borderline. Uh, another one that I've seen recently. Um, no, that, that's the ritual is the one I'm talking about actually. And then another one I've seen is uh, the Apostle. Oh right, okay. Yeah, where. Okay, there is clearly a supernatural element to that, but it takes a long time for you to know that it, that it's not just another creepy cult movie. And that I watched that one when I had the flu and I was really uh -huh. like feverish. It's probably not the best idea. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was a good CB horror movie. Um, you know, decently enough acted, had huge plot holes, but was enjoyable. Um, and we don't get a lot of those CB horror movies anymore. We either get mm -hmm. F's or A's like, right. um, uh, so that's interesting, but I, I find that I find that folk horror though. Well, what's also tied to this progressive menu, it does seem to lend itself to like a strong overlap with art house cinema. Definitely. Um, why do you think that is? Uh, there's probably something to the whole, uh, association with, uh, pastoral aesthetics and, uh, I don't know the notion of outsider arts, even though it's not really outsider. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, thinking of Ari Aster in particular, like he's got so many weird little short films that he's made. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I feel like Ari Aster was going to be an art house. Um, I think about uh, who's the British version of this. He did a field in England. Um, a field in England. Yeah, that movie's crazy. I'm not. I'm not it it's set in the English Civil War, and it may or may not involve either a drug trip or witches. I'm sold. Um, and <laughs> you really can't tell. <laughs> um, so who is that? I'm. I'm going to cheat and look it up right now. But um, so, but a lot of these uh, are coming out as like, they have art house distribution. Ben Wheatley. Ben Wheatley is who I'm thinking of. Um, and it, it seems to be very hot right now in the kind of, we don't expect, I mean, Ari Aster and Eggers are making tons of money. Um, oh, yeah. As is, and you know, I mentioned off air that Jordan Peele um, was uh, adjacent to this, not quite the same, but they're doing stuff that's, uh, he's doing stuff that's similar. Um, but, but there's a whole lot of these films actually now coming out and like the, the Netflix, um, 
slash um, independent film circuit slash I'm going to go straight to streaming, but I'm not a cheap straight to streaming movie. I'm the straight the streaming movies that you feel good talking to your friends about, not the one that you secretly like and don't tell everyone that you're watching. Right. Um, category. Um, and I've been thanking God for them during the pandemic because, you know, I have been sick of, you know, I'm actually kind of glad that this quote elevated horror is what's popular right now, because if I had to watch another conjuring movie, I was going to stick my head to it. Yeah, Um. (laughs) definitely. It it does. You know, when I hear the term elevated horror, I sort of like I'm like, but at the same time, it's like, uh, what what are the alternatives here? Mm. Yeah, I mean, and I guess also in the 90s, uh, in the early aughts, the late 90s, you had a lot of that found footage stuff. I mean, because also you can argue that uh, Blair Rich is a folk car. Um, yeah, it's debatable. It's debatable. Why not? Um, why not? Um, I don't know why not, actually. I mean, it is about folk tales. It, it yeah. meets all the criteria. It's just you think of you think of found footage things kind of as their own thing. Right. And um but of course, like Blair, Blair Witch was like the found footage movie, kind of like defined the genre. So obviously they weren't thinking of that. No, you know, when they made it. No, I mean, um, the comparison, I mean, the only movie that I could really think about that was found footage like that prior is like Cannibal Holocaust, right? Like, like that. there's not a whole lot of other movies that, that take that until Blair Rich. And then like mm-hmm. for a while, everybody who wanted to make a cheap movie and try to make a bajillion dollars um, did found footage. And really it wasn't until paranormal activity where people figured out a way to do it in a way that people would kind of take seriously again. I still um, have not watched a single one of those movies. They're jump scares. Yeah. They're, they're jump scares. The movie. Um, yeah. Involving demon witches that you never see um, and possession. And I mean, I had a, I had an academic friend. One thing I learned about academics is um, when you're into like, when they study, uh, particularly when they're like in ret cop programs, um, it's a very good way to uh, watch the crap you watched as a, um, as a teenager and then make broad social commentary and sound smart. Sort of justify, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can justify your crap taste. I mean, now we all do it because we can all become commentators on podcasts and That's, YouTube. But right. But, I've, I've sort of had the opposite problem is because I, I don't know. Like, I've gotten to the point where it's like I can almost n- not enjoy horror movies anymore because I'm like thinking of what my take has to be. And oh, God. I, think I, yeah, I know. I, I hate it. I think I just need a break. I was like that when I was an ac- when I was an academic actually for one of the reasons I got so in the history um when I got out of my MFA program was like I couldn't read literature anymore because I felt like I either needed to teach it or break it down mm-hmm. um or critique it for a workshop and it took about 3 years like the only thing I could read was history and then like sci-fi books and then horror novels and then I slowly worked my way up to contemporary fiction um, again. So I know it's, there's something about when you all you do is analyze and have to make takes and yeah and do definitely. meta commentary. They just it, it's also you know not to mention that it's like tied to revenue generation. Yeah, so. it's a job, right? Yeah, even it, what is it? Uh, Petty, uh, petty B E busker alienation. Um, <laughs> I, you know, and I've gotten to the point where I make like a few hundred bucks for my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it really shouldn't motivate me that much. Um, cause I, I do have a, a full-time job. It's not like I'm relying on this income. It's, but it's still, it is like a force. It is like yeah. a presence in my life. Oh man. I know that. Like w- Hell, when I was when I first started podcasting, being both doing my own and being a podcast guest, um, uh, eight nine years ago, 
I found myself becoming weirdly obsessed with it. And that's when nobody made money off of it. Cause even Patreon had just started and like people weren't really comfortable with it yet. Mm -hmm. And um, these mega Patreon podcasts weren't a thing. Um, you were, you were blogging when like libertarians were the thing, right? Yeah. I started, I started when I first started, uh, I started blogging in 2008. I started podcasting um, about 2012 when I was abroad. Mm -hmm. Um, and originally it was actually just a way, it was one of three ways I used to, to stay in contact with my home culture and to take these ideas I was processing as an academic. And I was going, you know, why the hell do I write a journal article, which four people are going to read and has a 1% chance of ever being cited again on this? Why don't I talk to this partly examined life? Because that's actually where I got my start as a guest oh, on yeah. partially examined life. Um, about, you know, uh, structuralism, post-structuralism and, uh, anthropology, you know, um, of language through, uh, Saussure, uh, Claude Levi-Strauss and Derrida. Okay. And, um, and then I started, you know, talking to people on Facebook about how much I hated Althusser, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, how, how reading Althusser as a, as a paleo conservative, uh, a literary critic and having to teach Lenin and philosophy and part of my uh, introduction to critical theory section of, of like the writing about literature course. It's like the, it's like the two Oh, it's like the one right after you get through um, um, 2010, like that very next course is like writing about literature. And there's a section mm -hmm. on like critical theory and they're like, teach structural Marxism. Y and you know, I, oddly <laughs> enough, it uh, Althusser never came up um, when I was studying, for what for whatever reason. Uh, but I still I haven't. Taught, I haven't been I'm able sure to get through Reading good. Capital. I can't get oh, through it. Uh, reading Capital, uh, yeah, it's uh, special. Um, <laughs> I have gotten through it, but it's so so. Anyway, I I, I started yelling about um, Zizek and all that, and um, I went looking for podcasts about that and found um and found uh diet soap which was the predecessor to inside zero books back when mm -hmm. it was an independent thing that came out of zine and portland like and uh doug lane and got from conspiracy culture into um and like green anarchism which was super big in the pacific northwest mm -hmm. into like nascent marxism via zizek and, that's so um, funny um and I was, uh, yeah, so, and I was actually radicalized by the housing downturn, actually similar to Doug, but um, I came from a completely different milieu. Like I was a, I was a high school Trotsky anarchist, like everybody in a small town, like, you know, I tell this story and this is absolutely true. Like we would try to get college radio from Atlanta by taking an old eighties boom box and running a wire to a coat hanger so that you could pick up yeah like like um awesome. like and like and you would go into the bookstore and like go into the barnes and nobles and you know like sneak in and like read the chomsky interview books and then go to a zine where they would like print those illegally into zines and like, it makes uh, sense that you know chomsky would have been like the most accessible thing at the time yeah i mean between like 96 and 9 11 and um yeah he was huge and um, his critiques of foreign policy, like I kept with me when I was in paleo conservative world, actually, like I, I never totally dropped all that. But um, but yeah, it's interesting because um, if you'd have told me that these worlds like this world of pop culture and this world of criticism would have ever met, I would have been surprised because in the late 90s cultural criticism was a thing. But like if you didn't go to an elite university. Um, if you went to like even a top tier state school, but you weren't um, like one of the the big 30 or whatever, um, Ivy League and Ivy League adjacent, there probably wasn't a whole lot of cultural studies until you got into grad school. That mm -hmm. changed while I was in school. Um, so like when I started my English degree, if you'd have read comic books, they would have laughed at you. And by the time, even by the time I was, even four years later, like 
you started seeing graphic novels on syllab on syllabi. It feels like it and just became legitimate, like in a year. It, it really did. Like, um, it had been a trend actually at the big universities for a while, but this this the state schools started picking it up. Um, Wh whoever rebranded them as graphic novels was a brilliant move. It was. I think a lot of this is. I literally think actually that a lot of this has to do with literary nerds lo loving Vertigo comics, in particularly Neil Gaiman Sandman. <laughs> like I, I, can see I, it. I, I, I think it's like that, and like Alan Moore, and then like, yeah, we'll study all this crap. So I'm gonna write my thesis on the X Men. Like, um, well, and I think it also became like, okay. Like, even I can make the argument, like, well, Charles Dickens is basically the serialized drama form of the same kind of literature. Totally. Um, so, yeah. Um, so it's interesting right now. I think what you're seeing, though, in, in like, elevated horror is the same trend you actually see in genre fiction. Um uh, when you have an over glutted market of people who are highly trained. Um, so since the 1970s, for example, you've seen the literarization of horror and sci-fi in particular. Um, so you have more and more people at first with, you know, really high literary aesthetics coming into the field. And then like explicitly people with like MFAs who disdain and poo poo genre fiction. Like, well, I can't get a job writing about how a professor has an affair with a student again. So I'm going to um, <laughs> oh, yeah. write a horror novel. Um, or, you know, and when someone like Margaret Atwood or Michael Strabone, who comes out of that literary world and is considered totally legit and made, and then they do something like that, and it gets branded speculative fiction, and all of a sudden you see all these MFAs um, <laughs> going into uh, genre stuff. I think you're seeing something similar in film. Like you have people who wanted to make art house films realizing that like not only is the first wave of of like new hollywood absorption of independent cinema over from the 70s the second wave of that in the 90s is also over well where can we get jobs totally and mid-tier genre fiction because people they're not needing to make enough money off of it so we can kind of do what we want like, and you can see how like it kind of might start out like a fluke mm -hmm. like uh I don't I don't know if uh, Eggers necessarily did that intentionally with the witch, but, um, you know, it took off and then people are like, oh, I see. I can do that. It's viable. Yeah, Eggers and Ari Aster. Um, I mean, there's a long history of of like the the art house horror movie going back to Igmar Berman, actually. But like definitely when you look at someone like. Um, uh gothic uh the devils ken russell ken russell um you know like where you have someone who kind of bridges those worlds mm -hmm. um and even someone like brian de palma who doesn't so much do it for horror but in thrillers yep. um and like sleaze movies but also is you know an art house craftsman and got started in like art theater um so it's not totally unique to right now but i think it happens when there's like when the studio system gets gets glutted, and I, I do think like Disney with its with the um, the eighty five thousand United World things starting with Marvel and going forward, it very much feels like the high period of the studio system serials in the in the thirties and forties. Like it's very similar. Um, That's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. I mean, I, you know, there's a sense in which I, I, I'm just so burned out on like, um, I'm so burned out on Marvel stuff. But when you put it in uh, historical terms like that, it actually makes me kind of want to rewatch some and be like, hmm, what's going on here? I think they're mostly military propaganda, frankly. But <laughs> I could see that. I actually, I put out, uh, I was talking in a stream yesterday about how like the current iteration of spider-man is just like totally they just totally erased all the class dynamics going on with the character you know oh yeah the sam raimi version mm -hmm. it's like 
He's working his ass off. His aunt may can, I think her house goes into foreclosure at some point or she has to sell it or something. And, uh, yeah, it's like, you don't see any of that in the current Spider-Man. They, they, they like play with it like this in the first Spider-Man movie with the, with Marissa Motobe's aunt may being a single mom. And then right. that's, that's it. That's it's over. <laughs> like, like, uh, super and also, rich it's Marissa Tomei. Can you really buy that she's? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> an Aunt May character. Yeah, right. even 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 at what forty five. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, no, it's 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 something else. But yeah, I, the Pentagon has a lot of influence on those movies because they have to they, they use a lot of military stuff, and to do that, you usually have to agree to certain things. Um, well, they have to agree to correctly depict the military. Correct. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's interesting because um, comic books as a as a written genre have a weird history with their relationship to power in the first place. Like, mm -hmm. like Batman's reactionary, Superman could go either way. Yeah, it's wholesome. Sometimes it's reactionary. Some like Grant Morrison's taking him as a working class hero is actually close to how he was originally designed to be. Um, you know, that's why he's like comes from you know the heartland of America. That's not a, just a conservative thing. It's like he's not from money. Is specifically he had a normal, was despite the fact he's a god um, background, right? But then you have the weird subversive stuff of the thirties and you have the comics code kind of like the code coming in and in, in films too. And they get all super, super normie, like more normie than normie for like until the eighties. And then you have people like Grant Morrison, Warren Ellis, um, Alan Moore and all that come into it. And, and even there though, you, it splits kind of evenly um, reactionary. Um, anarchisty progressive right like um although you know i i think of something like the watchman which should have ended superhero comics <laughs> like, yeah if the universe was fair and right and people paid paid attention that should have just ended the genre people actually like took that movie seriously yeah i mean what well, it, it's funny because Zack Snyder is interesting in so much that um, when he's successful, you get the feeling that it's despite of himself. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so I also wanted to... I, um, mm -hmm. I was going to say, I just watched the cartoon version of uh, Red Sun. Mm. Which I... Uh, I never read that. I, I never read the comic book, but uh, it's something else. I do. I do like when he murders stalin yeah that's cool <laughs> <laughs> red sun's uh red sun's fascinating there's another what there what is a comic that was soviet superman that was not red sun there's another comic it's atomica oh. um uh anyway that's that's also interesting it's a darker take um so I have to remember what it is, but um, it's, it's darker than Superman having to like, uh, I don't know how do, he, he brainwashes people into doing what he wants. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Red Sun is uh, is uh, very much a. Um, a Cold War piece. <laughs> yeah totally. even if it's even even if it's sympathetic for the time i go back and read like like uh even as late as 1992 when the soviet union's falling apart like when x-men one comes out by uh jim lee like they still have like weird cold war shit going on and like while the soviet union's literally like collapsing um <laughs> and that's I, when i read know, comic books as a kid so i i was uh in high school reading animal farm and it was we we're still getting the anti-soviet you know stuff there which mm -hmm. is to, i mean to to some extent it's legitimate but you know when the united states is the one propagating it it's like hmm 
Yeah. One of our commentators, uh, KGB operatives, said, Kira's video, Sack Snyder, uh, a world based on spite, is such a good look at the reactionary slack that he makes. Yeah, consider Sack Snyder kind of the Frank Miller of comic book movies, as Frank Miller is to comic books. Um, but one gets the feeling that he didn't quite understand that the Watchmen was making fun of his very position, like the, the Alan Moore material. <laughs> yeah, it seems like he took it seriously. Yeah, yeah. Like, like he doesn't get that, like, all the positions in there are un, are un, are uh, are unappealing and super right wing. Problematic even, at best. <laughs> even the left wing characters, such as Vite, are reactionary. Ultimately, like mm -hmm. like like Vite is the ultimate nasty left liberal, and like um, Rorschach is not only a reactionary but also self deluded. And um, yeah, he's a crank. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, the second owl man literally like um, is sexually impotent unless he beats someone up. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you get the feeling that like Zack Snyder didn't totally. How do you take that? Joke. Yeah, it, it does kind of bo it's boggling. Like, <laughs> how do you take that material and and you're like, oh yes, serious. Yeah, literally. But I'm also totally serious about like even. Even Superman's going to be dark and fashy. Um, right. Um, and uh, I'm going to depict 300 and amp up the weird racial stereotypes against Persians that Frank Miller had. I'm going to even put it on more crack than it actually was. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, the Persians are not only not, you know, not human. They're literally monsters. <laughs> And we're going to release this at the end of um, the war on terror. Uh, the uh, the end in quotation marks of the war on terror. Um, yeah, that was. I remember getting yelled at on the on Live Journal of all things for saying that movie was fash before it was cool. Um, because the comic book is, and because you just you could see Frank Miller like. I mean, Frank Miller is an interesting case point because you, you take uh, the Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. um, and he is clearly actually aware of the nasty fascist implications of, of uh, Batman's revanchism. But like within 10 years, he's like, but it's a good thing. He, like, yeah, <laughs> he, he all, it doesn't. All, he it seems ambivalent. It doesn't seem like he's against it, per se, mm -hmm. towards the beginning. But yeah, right. Like Dark Knight. Uh, what's it called? Dark Knight Returns. Yeah, Dark Knight Returns. You, when the Dark Knight Returns, there are there, like there's even like deliberate like you'll find crypto swastikas and stuff in Batman imagery in that book. So like you know, and oh. I don't think Frank Miller was pro Nazi, but but by the time you get to um, the later iterations of that book, you're just like, no, you 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 just like what you've just decided that what you're critiquing is actually an objective good, like. I've it's watched... worth thinking about this stuff because it's like uh, I, I read those before I got like uh, radicalized, right? Uh huh. So I I don't remember what my take on it was at the time. I just thought it was really fucking weird. I uh, I read all that. St so I I am almost certain I am a decade older than you. So um, yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah. Um. So You're like proto i mean proto millennial i am i am i am i am in the three-year dividing line between millennial and gen x depending yeah so my first publication as a poet was in a book called generation x a generation defining itself in poetry um okay. but i have been told by people i'm a millennial um i'm born in 1980 um in the carter admin in, in the as i like to say in the very last waning seconds of the carter administration um so and it shows <laughs> yeah it no that's definitely borderline i mean yeah there's no yeah line. yeah because i i am uh i remember the cold war and i grew up in a time where everyone could get on the internet but you probably had to go to a public library mm -hmm. like so like I I remember like I did zines and we had a GeoCities account that I would sneak into the into the library at my high school to to edit after school and like the two computers that had the internet. Um 
And I feel like I got the best of all possible worlds because I was like 12 years old when you could like log on to AOL and go into chat rooms. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I I was definitely a troll at some point. I had a AOL actually called my house uh, to tell my mother what I was saying in the chat. So that's fun. And then you sort of get a, I don't know. I was like 16 or 17 going on new grounds. Looking at all those flash cartoons, it's a lot that was edgy. college for me. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of edgy stuff, but also like salad fingers. You know, I just felt like I just yeah. You got you 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 remember the internet just before it got um, corporatized. Yeah, like, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, um. And I, I grew up, you know, when like, if, if someone wanted to, I don't know, use what, what at the time, 90% of the internet was used for go on and look at porn or whatever. It would take a half an hour to download a picture when like, so we didn't bother. It was just very inconvenient. Yeah. Yeah, It was just like, this is too much work. Like, (laughs) um, so, um, you know, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting time though. And, and so I was in college during all the Bush years and, um, and, uh, I was teaching university, um, actually by the end of the Bush years, um, you know, off and on as a MFA adjunct at night, <laughs> you know, sort of deal. Um, and, um, and it was wild to see the changes of university culture, the changes of pop culture. Um, it's interesting because our standards for pop culture are different. Like in the nineties, we knew that pop culture was trash and like, we just accepted it. And I feel like in the, by the aughts and that, you know, by the aughts and the wire and particularly exactly. by, yeah. by the art teams, we start like pretending that like our pop culture isn't trash. Like we're in the age of right. peak television. The um, anti-hero. It's so, you know, it's yeah, it's so edgy. Like, um, and, and we pretend that shows like, um, Game of Thrones, which the books are actually for what they are, um, decent, you know, for, for kind of hard boiled, no frills, uh, high medieval magic sci-fi, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're decent. Um, I, I don't dislike George R. R. Martin. But the show, I always was like, why do people think this is so good? Like, the acting's really good. The visuals are stunning. But, like, it doesn't make sense. The timelines don't work. <laughs> like... <laughs> right, if you think about how long it would take to travel places and whatnot. Yeah, yeah or, like, like people... Babies born at the same time in the storyline are different ages at one point. Like, it's just, mm-hmm. like, somebody's two and somebody else is still a baby. And it's just, like... What's I think the, uh, yeah. Game of Thrones will like forever be known for just the show that started the trend of like, we're going to kill off major characters and there's nothing you can do about it. I, Jay, I, I bring Josh, we, Joss Whedon. And if we all know that he was kind of a creep in the nineties, so <laughs> many tropes would have been avoided. Yeah. I don't mean to like, I don't mean to treat Buffy the way we should treat, um, Harry Potter, which I've been on the anti Harry Potter league since I was 19 years old because I was objectively correct. But, um, <laughs> oh, same. Yeah, I've always been anti Harry Potter. It's like, read another book. When people, when I was meeting English majors reading Harry Potter, and I, I am not this much of an elitist generally, but I would just be like, read an adult book. Like, I've literally, uh, <laughs> I've literally been asked in job interviews, like, if I'm, if I'm like a huffle puff or, like, uh, I'm just like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't read those books. I haven't seen the movies. So that's like the, that's, that's the millennial version of if what, what animal are you? Yeah, basically. <sighs> I would always say bear to ensure that I didn't get the job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, well, <laughs> hmm. um, I'm alone. I'm a lonely, solitary, burly predator. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, bears get shit done. I don't know. They do, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, 
Yeah. So we, we've been all over about pop culture. I guess the full car thing. Um, you know, well, I think I think with the folk horror, uh, you touch on something interesting, which is like the possibility that it's that the resurgence of folk horror might be connected with um, maybe like the end of a business cycle. I don't know. Yeah. So I, I've been watching like I've been watching when certain kinds of horror movies are popular. So slashers are popular in the upswing of the 80s and the upswing of the 90s. Um uh, the exploitation and zombie movies both are popular and downswing. So, aughts after 9 11. 9 11 does actually complicate things because, like, that's when you get real torture porn and, and stuff, which is, yep. which is interesting upping the ante because you got to also, uh, people forget, but at the time, this was back before like social media would it really edited shit. You could go and find beheading videos on Facebook um, yeah. from from um terror attacks and stuff um yeah i've seen a few in my day um yeah i would not either but like and also i like the like i remember extreme internet sites like you being able to find stuff that you just was a little bit frightening that you could find it actually like Mm -hmm. um fairly easily It, it does make it interesting to me when everyone's freaking out about what's available on the internet now and i'm like where have you been the last 35 years with the internet? Like, like from, from message boards forward, the internet has been a den of scum and villainy villainy. And like, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I think about some of the stuff I watched when I was like a, you know, teenager, me and my friends would like, we would be downloading like faces of death on Oh, yeah, or or just like Faces of Death existed and you could go rent it from a video store. Yeah, you could just go. (laughs) Yeah, we could we couldn't because we were kids. But right. It was readily available. Like like so when I when I was like in high school, it was like you go find your 18 year old friend to rent that. We watched one of them and we never watched another one because I mean, one they were it was actually mostly boring and a lot of it was fake anyway. Yeah. Um, But, you know, like also like the guinea pig films and all that all that extreme cinema i do think we live in an age where we still have a lot of extremophile cinema um i'm looking at you france and japan um but it it was interesting i was thinking about like the difference between if you talk about these cycles right um if you think about um, french uh new extreme versus uh torture porn Mm -hmm. um and the political values and the and its relationship to the business cycle um it was interesting to me that french new extreme always at least had the pretense of trying to say something um and outside of the first saw movie which i do think actually did try to say something i'm not quite sure what it was trying to say but it did try to say something maybe um like you know (laughs) value your life it's actually the first saw movie is a reactionary but very well constructed movie um it's not it's vitalist yeah it's super vitalist right um that's a good that's a good way to read that um um and also like i you know jj abrams hadn't turned everything into a puzzle yet so um right (laughs) i got um, in with uh jj for a while i'm ashamed of myself are you going to, as a younger millennial, is this just means you have to get out like your your flail and, you know? Well, uh, I, luckily I avoided the Harry Potter trend, but JJ did get me. Which JJ got you? Um, so I never got into Lost, uh, but Cloverfield, I was a big fan of. I will admit that um, that actually my same Korean. Um, friend who got me to watch all the paranormal activity movies who was a scholar, who was a rhetoric scholar also got me into um cloverfield and convinced me that it was brilliant for about 30 minutes um <laughs> i do think the sequel to cloverfield is actually a, a remarkable uh, good movie um 10 cloverfield lane yes it is a good movie i it's think that's good. a I think it's a mark. There's another one that I've never watched, uh, but right. That's why I was confused. But, but, um, 10 Cloverfield Wayne is like that. I'm going to end on that one. That's a high note. 
like yeah um i'm not sure if it's well i would have to look at it again i'm not sure if it's saying anything but it was entertaining john goodman yeah um so but i was actually thinking so the french the french the french situation versus the american situation um does seem to like uh, it also does seem to have like they related to somewhat of like their stances on the war on terror and and stuff like that um uh although i know a lot of the american um torture porn people thought they were saying stuff about the u.s the, um like i think about hostile and he like mm-hmm. Rolf, like trying totally. to convince me he's saying something about the american character in hostile um but um it's interesting because I, I do think uh, that that the 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 extreme films um, in France, in particular, um, I think about Martyrs and um, uh, that was uh, the new film um, Claire De, uh, Claire, no Claire Denis. Uh, what's that film about cannibals? I don't remember. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. My encyclopedic knowledge of weird, gory film is running out on me. Um, I'm just terrible with movie names. Yeah, that's fair. But yeah, so back to the business cycle theory. So like 9-11 kind of screws it up, actually. But you do see during the same period as torture porn, you see the return of zombie movies. Mm -hmm. Um and you see, and that's very clearly tied to the beginnings of the economic breakdown. Like it starts around 2005. Um, and you see the um, return of, um, towards the end of the business cycle, when things start to pick up again, you see, you see Focar. And I mentioned like, you saw a similar trend in Britain Um when folk horror came up in the sixties and seventies, it was kind of when they were finally getting out of a long slump. Um, but it was still pretty slumpy. It was not a good recovery for Britain. It's, like, the end. it's in the wake of some kind yeah. of economic. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to think like Britain's the only European country that doesn't really benefit the post the benefit from the post-war boom in the same way as everybody else. Cause their empire fell apart. Mm-hmm. So like, so they, they see stagnation where everybody else is like actually improving. Um, uh, I mean, things are pretty rough in Germany in the forties, but by the mid fifties, like, um, plus I don't know if anyone was allowing them to make horror films anymore. (laughs) Um, that expressionism led to bad things. Um, yeah, but it it is interesting because you do see, I, I do think you see, I mean, you can make too much of this, but like you do see them tied to both political climates and business cycles. I think is where you see trends seem to parallel with that, at least after 1960s, like, you know, in the development of mass media. So zombie movies seem to come up at a certain time, occult and occult movies, which are analogous to folk horror in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. come up usually at the upper end. Like you think about when the exorcist come out. So things are, in the long slump, but slightly getting better in the seventies, you start seeing a lot more occult movies. Um, now this could be just my tendency towards pareidolia and finding trends that aren't there. Um, and this is like, I'm not making a causal claim here. I'm not saying like that there is a clear, you know, causal relationship of the business cycle to which genre, but I it does it. seem correlative. <laughs> like I could see like, it. And uh, I have a tendency when you present these things, to me is I have a tendency to run with them, make way too much of them. It's kind of like a joke on my channel. You know, you haven't gone as far as like the meme analysis guy who, who I think turns every, he strikes me as a reactionary. I can't tell if he's a reactionary or a troll. Isn't that the same thing? Well, I mean, (laughs) true actually, because I mean, how many people start off making fun of right wing things and then ended up like all of a sudden believing what they're making fun of? Um, or at best, just funneling attention towards it. Right. Um, it's uh, it's it's actually 
he does stra- there's there's some strange reactionary stuff in there. I mean, what I couldn't figure out is if he was making fun of Jordis and P- Peterson style younging analysis or actually believes it. Like, um, maybe one day I'll ask him, but I I, I, I don't want to platform someone who I'm not sure on on that. Yeah, I don't know. Not to not to openly uh, talk smack about somebody, but. Uh, that's, that was just my first impression. I think it's, you know what? I have a sort of red flag that comes up when, uh, I, I sense that people are like fetishizing art in a certain way. Right. That's the vibe I got from him. Aestheticized politics is, uh, usually doesn't end so well. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, not that, I mean, I think all politics has an aesthetic, even like geriatric Democrats, for example, um, are the Republican ill-fitting Brooks Brothers suit. But um, and it's not and, a good aesthetic, but yeah. and look, and, and you know, increasingly they have a beard like I do, but their face looks like it's made out of angry play doh. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- it is an aesthetic, um, and it is con- it is somewhat consistent. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, it would be interesting to know, um, though, uh, like. How you tr- when you run with these ideas as explanatory, how useful they are. I, I noticed you don't do, you don't do the obscurantist thing where like you're, um, and sometimes I fear some of my other left wing cultural commentary podcast can't s- mention three words without bringing up Lacan or Hegel and some strange weird aestheticized misappropriation of one or the other. <laughs> I try um, not to do that. Um... I am a hyper self-aware person and I come from a lower middle class background where that is highly made fun of. I have two older brothers. So it's like one of these things that is just I I have a a, a knee jerk reflexive tendency to uh at the very least know if I'm making a reference like that mm-hmm. that I need to couch it in like several layers of self-deprecating humor yeah i i can um i've come from a similar background i am uh my my mom was a waitress until i was 19 then she was a nurse for like 10 years and my uh my stepdad was a mechanic and my brothers are split between like hyper working class almost lump in and then one of my other brothers is like a uh a, a doctor of physical therapy um mm-hmm. and then there's me um, and so, but I mean, oddly, even my other, my, my, my brother who has a, technically has a higher degree than me, like, will always be like, Derek, don't talk like a weirdo humanities academic, like, stop it. Speak like a normal person. Um, that's good advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, for, and I'll tell you having when particularly in my thirties, when I started having to try to take this scholarly left wing theory and i started in theory then it moved into history and like spell it out for normies i mean it's kind of my job right i mean it's pop the left is partly about that like um Mm -hmm. i realized how many people can't and and i realized that maybe i didn't also completely understand the verbiage i was using because i wasn't being made to explicated in a cognitively rich way, i.e. normal people can understand. Right. Um, but it's yeah, I, I, um, I did, I did a podcast about, uh, sort of like explaining, uh, Jameson's political unconscious. Mm-hmm. It got several comments, um, that sort of gave me anxiety of like, I just don't, I don't know even where to begin. Like, what do I do? I can't understand any of this. And I'm like, I'm sorry. This is my fault. This is not yeah. your fault. Yeah. As much as I love long rambly um, videos and God knows if as as Var and Blog continues and I don't have an editor, who knows how long they'll end up being. You might have a three hour ramp for me one day. But um, I'll listen to it. <laughs> um it's uh it's very it is very real to like have that in the back of your head and you know when people don't have it and you also know the kind of person who has been able to get away with 
obscuring their their knowledge sector by throwing around terms. And I'll be honest with you, know a lot of humanities PhDs who really do like if you make them define their shit and you like no you can't reference you can't name drop you can't reference anything else if you name drop you have to explain the ref like they just break down <laughs> like well so that would be that would be a fun game show i would pay <laughs> to watch that <laughs> maybe we should do it sometime like or... yeah that sounds fun <laughs> do you actually know your shit <laughs> <laughs> um I guess that um, this might be a good bridge to the next thing I wanted to talk to you about tonight because we've been on for an hour and 15 and we, we have veered off. Of, we have covered one of the things we were going to cover, but um, talked about everything but that. Um, it's uh, It's interesting to me that whole explanatory matrix right now, though, because there's also a way in which being, I like to call it pseudo clarity, are or even um, so clear, so clear, you're hard to understand. I'll give you an example of that. Um, Christopher Lash is sometimes rather reactionary, um, but people project all sorts of things onto him. Unlike, say, Foucault and Adorno and stuff, who he's referencing actually a, a lot in those essays. He he lived and by more this coherent idea. and more yeah like, clear way. <laughs> Yeah, he he's he he's not he refuses to use jargon, everything, and he his essays are always set up like you get the historiography, you get an example, and then you get a history, like you get a couple of historical case examples, mm -hmm. um, and then a very clear reading. The problem is actually if you read like say culture of narcissism, his definitions and some of those things are super specific, and those definitions are ignored because he writes so clearly, you don't really need these technically precise definitions he must mean narcissism the way we do and not in this right. hyper pacific social psychoanalytic way are um you know oh i didn't catch that he was referencing foucault i thought he was just crapping on the libs like well yeah but so was foucault like yeah um you know I, I mean, I, it's just i think a lot of it is just based on superficial readings yeah well you know I, having written a book on it I'm I'm beginning to see that, but I do think there is a truth that he might write too clearly and too good for people to be on alert to be reading closely. Um, so I don't. That's not like pseudo profundity or pseudo clarity. It's more just like you're too clear for your own good. Like, mm -hmm. like you seem so clear that people don't know when to have, you know, specific references and stuff um, on hand. Um, but. Um, I was thinking about this in documentaries because of I mean, we're going to talk about documentaries. We're specifically going to talk about Adam Curtis, and you and I share some opinions. I think you probably are more forgiving of Adam Curtis than I am. Um, I will say this as a person who I am a real fan of um, All Wrapped Up in Machines of Loving Grace. I think it's a I think it's a really good documentary. That's um, like the one I haven't seen. Um, and I also like, I forgot the name was the force of nightmares, the power um, of nightmares, the powers of nightmares. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, which I also think is pretty good. Um, but you know, I, 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 I mainstreamed his, uh, what the, the, uh, his psychological history, you know, I can't get you out of my head. Um, which I also don't even really think was psychological. <laughs> Actually, I was like, wait. But, um, and, and you could literally, if you followed my tweets, you could watch me go from like, yeah, Curtis is onto something to who is this reactionary get? Like, like I, th I think <laughs> the one, the one that, uh, the one that struck me is, uh, you were saying something about low info leftists yes. and I was like, I'm in this tweet and I don't like it. <laughs> um, um yeah um, well, i forget so, what the point was no it was i said low info leftists often don't notice that um that uh the the methodology the the structure of an adam curtis documentary is to give you a bunch of narratives mm -hmm. to use that to cast doubt on anyone having a clear vision of 
of the narrative. But because he's the only person who has any idea how these relate, and he's not just presenting them totally blank. Like, um, there would be a way to just present this to you, decontextualize, and you have to make the context yourself. Um, I, I think about what's that, that room, the Kubrick documentary room. Uh, yeah. Uh, God damn it. Um, 620, though. <laughs> it's, the, it's whatever the room is in The Shining. Right. Um, I love that movie. Yeah, that movie. Um, and because of that, he has a polemical voice that is super authoritative because unlike where um, the, the sh I'll just call it the generic shining documentary where the guy so w presents the theories. He won't even let you know who's presenting them. He'll like, and so you almost blend the theories together in that doc. You have to, you have to totally make the meaning um, yourself, but Curtis doesn't do that. His videos are shot a lot like conspiracy videos where like there's so many disparate information. So you go to someone who's going to build a narrative for you. And Curtis kind of has his cake and eats it too, particularly in the century of the self. It's a polemic that, that is constantly casting the doubt on anyone's ability to change the world. That's primary point is that somehow you can. Um, right. It's, it's hard it, to figure out a way out of that feedback loop whenever you watch his stuff. Right. And I think the authoritarian voice of the structure of the way he's presenting it, and because, like I said, it's aesthetically similar to a, a conspiracy video. That's why I think people misidentify him as a conspiracy theorist, because he's not. I mean, I will say some of the stuff he said about China in the most recent one is close to conspiratorial. Um, the hmm. whole, like, Dung was trying to get revenge for the opium war thing. I'm like, that is over-interpretation, because... I mean, that may be, yes, I've read Chinese documents and translation that talk about, you know, the effects of the opium war and mm. making sure that never happens again in the 70s. But um, I don't think that's why they were trading with the West. I think they lost their block with the Soviet Union because the Sino-Soviet split intensified it over the 60s and 70s. Um, and that Mao had screwed up the economy twice. So they needed a major trading block, and that's what. It, done with well, them. this is like a, this is very straightforward, like materialist, right? You know, uh, as opposed to I guess Adam Curtis would be more interested in like the memes that were postulated at the time, right? And I, and I think it's a limited like the the psychological history of the self means that he's often over interpreting people's subjective psychology. Mm. Um, and so it made me mad. I mean, and then there's just like, he gets. You're the I only like... person on the planet. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say like, you're the only person on the planet who is mad about that. Probably not. Right. No, but I did a, I did a panel with um, a range of academics. So an aesthetic academic, um, uh, Helena Sheehan, who is a Irish, um, although she, Spent, she was in a, she was actually in America for a lot of the new left events that were in the middle of that movie. Um, um, an Irish Marxist academic who writes on Marxism and the history of science and the new left, um, and a, a, a cybersecurity specialist. And we were all like, and then me, we we're all like, there are nuggets of things that are true in here, but he's so sloppy with everything. And the subjective focus seems to be a way to be sloppy because it's not really like he's going into the actual psychology in any meaningful sense. He's mm -hmm. reading the psychology into the memes, the cultural ephemera, but he's over interpreting things. And sometimes he's very loose with the facts. Um, not so much wrong. Although a friend of mine told me he was out, he was, he was wrong about what Tupac was in prison for. Um, he says in the documentary, it's it's a uh, rape, right? And I can't remember if that's actually correct. I, it wasn't. I, I think I don't remember that. You know, I I feel like I was a fan of Tupac, and um, when he said that, I was like, wait a minute, I don't remember that. I thought I thought it was a yeah. It may... Um. Yeah, I thought it was. So I'm just pulling up his mugshot. 
Ajá. Um, sexually abusing, but it is, it is not say rape. Huh. I did find uh, that narrative in particular to be pretty, uh, compelling as a sort of case study for I, what, what I am reading to be his general thesis, which I'm probably not going to articulate very well, but like, um, you can see in early interviews that Tupac is very clearly uh, has his wits about him, is an intelligent young man, uh, has a basic kind of ideological. He, he's very like clear eyed about certain problems in his community. And then what happens to the guy? Yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I think that the narrative he tells about the uh, that Curtis tells about the LA gangs is negligent to the point of almost being racist. Um, I don't mean that like he's, he's intentionally actively racist, but I mean like it's just he didn't have the context for it. I watched that with um, uh, and I was in discussion with uh, uh, Pascal Robert uh, Roberts and uh, and Jason Miles and and. Um, they were fascinated with the my, with the Michael X narrative and all that, but then when we got to Tupac, they were just like, "No, like that's way too simple." Oh, yeah. um, the 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 paranoia and the Illuminati conspiracy things was real. Right. Um, but what I found interesting is Curtis didn't even look at the most obvious case of that with the Panthers. Do you know about the history of the Crips? I do not. So. Um, the Crips are a kind of third tier generation. Um, they're, they are directly related to the Panthers. Um, there's like a direct line from the Panthers to the Crips. Yes. Um, so, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's hard, like, so there we go. Um, Stanley Williams and um, uh, Raymond Washington uh, were reacting to the to the beginnings of the disintegra the disintegration of the Panthers in the late sixties, um, and they thought they needed to focus more on Cleaver's line of going in and organizing the lump. And this was Eldridge Cleaver's big thing before he did the black liberation army and then became a weird quasi Nixon, <laughs> you know, uh, re almost reactionary. Um, and so they formed a alliance of the gangs in the area. Um, and, um, they were, they, they thought they were going to militarize this and they ended up getting sucked more and more into the narco trade, um, basically. And Stanley, uh, um, st you know, Stanley Williams in particular um, uh, was, was really regretful about this. Um, it was part of his appeal. And what he thought the Crips were going to be was the street version of the Boy Scouts for the for the Panthers because the Panthers had done outreach into gangs too. Like if you even watch the most recent Black uh, Black Messiah, Judas and the Black Messiah movie, yeah, they they go into the Crowns, meeting, um, you know, kind of forming an allegiance and and um, quasi going straight as protection for the Panthers and and it's stuff like that. When you put it that way, yeah. So the Crips is related to that, and I was like. If if Curtis had done his research, like about the the weird relationship between the disintegration of the Black Power movement and the the fact that the that the gangs actually started um, with they didn't start out as anything to do even with criminality they were they were kind of like independent youth groups that they thought were going to be 
you know, these community protection groups and all that, that got more and more into, got pulled into, you know, um, basically lump in activity to have any sort of funding at all. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, it's, uh, it, it's just a really tragic story that, that really goes into this. I mean, goes into this thing that you see in Tupac Shakur, where you're trying to like speak truly about that culture while also being part of it, while also trying to have it reform itself while also having to deal with, particularly in Shakur's place, the pressures of fame mm -hmm. um, and being asked to represent your community in this, in this way, you know, that, um, I mean, the, the function of, say, gangster rap as both a critique of inner city poverty, but also it becomes almost a, I mean, white culture kind of treats it as a minstrel show <laughs> in some ways yeah. as, as things develop. Um, and that, that I don't think that, I think that Titchen was, you know, really deleterious on Tupac. It shows up in his poetry, actually. Like, um, so I, I and and the the drug the, the the drug issue had hit even the Panther community. I mean, it goes into you know Effendi, who is Effendi Shakur, who's a like a truly impressive woman. I mean, she was able to you know shame and argue a informant down and get acquitted. Um, that's awesome. Like that's it's an amazing that's an amazing story. So like, I also think. Man, if you want to talk about that, you need to devote real time to that because that's, that's there's so much stuff. That's in what that. I was going to say. Like when you're saying all this, it's like obviously Curtis is his eyes are too big for his stomach. He right. is uh, trying to do way too many things at once. He's trying to juggle chainsaws, basically. And, and he ends up, um, yeah, and he ends up being half materialist. Like there are times where he like kind of flirts with materialism like this when he was like, right. Like uh, automation made mining more efficient, so you didn't need as much workers, so the unions weren't as useful. Next, jump away. <laughs> like, I was the like, the problem is that stuff is too boring for him. Right, he's gonna throw it in to kind of deal with it, but doesn't want to. Like those are so crucial to what's going on. Yeah, particularly in um, you know, my and very working class minority uh, movements where your 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 jobs for your service sector jobs for them tend to be for for um, African Americans tend to be um, like, for example, a lot of government jobs because the mm -hmm. non discrimination clause is actually monitored. Like, and right to work states, yeah, sure, it's illegal to discriminate, but you can't prove it There's not unless a, you have like someone. Oversight. Yeah, right. Well, unless you have someone just say, "I am firing you because you're black," mm -hmm. like, or "I am firing you because of X," it is very hard to prove it, right? So, so a lot of people who had to go into services to work went into government jobs. And the other thing they were in, you know, once sharecropping and stuff died in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, um, was semi-skilled labor. Um, they didn't require education because it was very hard to get, um, particularly, um, particularly when you don't have a lot of wealth and it was shut off to a lot of minority groups, not just black people really, um, for a long, long time. And, um, and what you had also seen in these areas, and Curtis does touch on this, and I didn't notice this. He did talk about the fact that there was a, like a black bourgeoisie that had emerged, um, you know, because of like the legacy of, you know, like segregation had had, had in some ways created a, 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 a microcosm society with its own elites, um, mm -hmm. you know, and all that. Like Curtis kind of touches on that, but. If you're going to touch that, you have to really do it justice. Like I, I personally, not only do I feel like I'm not necessarily the right person to talk about it for obvious reasons, but like, um, I also feel like, um, even with my knowledge of a lot of this and I come from the, I come from the deep South. So like some of this is even just like firsthand knowledge mm -hmm. from people I grew up with. Um, you know, um, my neighborhood was, was transitional, which is the cold word for mixed. Um, but when I was a kid, if you were white and on the streets after midnight, they call the cops on you. And if you were black and on the streets after dark, they caught the a cops on mm -hmm. you. Um, like, so 
that was, um, that was, you know, and, and there were, there were black people in my neighborhood, but, but the city was still like, it was two working class neighborhoods and one was all black and one was 80% white. And, um, so this kind of stuff is sort of like, you'd hear this stuff and like, I kind of knew about like black wall street vaguely before everyone discovered it. Uh, thanks to yeah. HBO. And now it's right. in everything as if they've always known it was there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just like, it's just reference. Like everyone knows about this, right? Thing that no one knew about until like shockingly until Watchmen covered it. <laughs> right. Now it's in, uh, you know, um, Lovecraft country. Mm -hmm. Um, but I could see how, well, okay. I want to, I want to index something before I forget it. Mm -hmm. Do you know where this rumor comes from that, uh, Adam Curtis is funded by Peter Thiel? Um, Thiel may give him some money. I mean, yeah, I have, I, I haven't traced that lineage. I, I have like, you'd be surprised who gets Koch brothers money, for example, indirectly. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are there are obvious like leftist groups like Spike that have been documented as getting Coke, well, uh, brothers money. But there's a lot of the anti-war movement gets it indirectly. So I would not be surprised if some of his funding does come from Peter Thiel, even if he doesn't know it. Um, Peter Thiel throws a lot of money around. Mm -hmm. um, so it's one of those things where like I would have to really trace it down. Um, I I do not necessarily take having a right wing funder and a broad basket of funders as proof that you're a secret reactionary. Right. But I do think it is a corrupting influence. Um, you know, it's definitely something I would keep in mind watching any of his future work. Right. I mean, just, you know, just for example, he may have more access to certain kinds of archives. Mm hmm. Um. I mean, did you get off of the last off of episode six? Did you get a weird populist feel from from Was episode six? The last one, yeah. Popular, uh, like gosh, he's like he's like the the, the 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 liberal classes, which I thought was funny. You called them classes. Um. Uh. Um. The liberal classes got you know, uh, didn't have answers, you know, blah, blah, blah. But Trump also didn't clear the swamp. I mean, um, and there's a vaguely populist and like thing in there to talk. The liberals saw themselves as protecting the working class. And I actually was like, maybe they did in Britain, but mm -hmm. the whole idea that liberals are protecting the working class has been, I've heard it brought up some, I've heard it brought up sometimes in the aughts, like in the, you know, back in Tom Frank, when he was still you know, kind of more adjacent to the Democrats, like Western Manor with Kansas days. But um, that feels like that was dropped in the eighties. <laughs> like... So I come from a family of uh, proud union Democrats. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was ingrained in me from a, a very young age. What region so are it, you from on the United States? I don't know your area, but just like uh, the Midwest. So, okay, so th th there's a difference there yeah, in the right. political culture. My dad was a uh, was an iron worker uh, until he uh, he died when I was 13 from uh, emphysema. Mm. But uh, you know he 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 had a grim grim upbringing. I, he basically grew up in a house without even working plumbing in uh tennessee um so yeah I, and my mom was a realtor so it was it's one of these things where it's like yeah yeah working class low income petty b yeah exactly 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 like uh after my dad died we were living be below the poverty line but also not feeling it terribly bad because he had left us some money right um so but but i always grew up with the ingrained notion that the democrats were the party of the working class and uh that has been slowly uh beaten out of me by 
reality. So I'm from the South. The Democrats are the party of segregation. Mm -hmm. Like Zell Miller was the last Democratic governor of the state I was from when I was a kid. That's in the 90s. The Dixiecrats, the Dixiecrats uh, ran everything and then they gave their city machines, explicitly gave them to the Black Caucus and the Black Caucus caught deals with them. They actually are still cutting deals with them. Like the Black Caucus had the Democrats drop certain things from the current voting voting rights bill so that their deals with the conservative um, districts to to restrict liberal districts to mostly black districts so they would maintain so they maintain a, a and I actually kind of see their point in this but it, it's it's pernicious um, to yeah. the whole um, would be maintained and um, I don't think it's because like you know I don't think black people are reactionary and sometimes some of the more reactionary liberals will try to are, are I say liberals, but they'll claim to be Marxist or whatever. Um, we'll say, but I do think there is a truth that the that the political machines that the 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 Black Caucus inherited in the South were Dixiecrat machines, and they are they are structurally and temperamentally conservative, and that has not changed, even though mm -hmm. they've changed hands. Um, and that that changing of hands that was two thousand. All right, I mean, people forget this, but like Georgia. All those southern states were democratic until about the end of the Clinton years. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't. A lot of those states did not vote for Clinton in the in you know his reelection campaign. But like that was the end of the of the the, the Nixon strategies, the Southern strategy. Although uh, one thing to remember about Nixon's strategy, Nixon had the Southern strategy, and he also had the Black entrepreneurial. Black Power Republican strategy, right. which is As largely forgotten. Earlier with um, what's his name? Yeah, Cleaver. Yeah, and mm -hmm. some of the, you know, um, Alex Haley. You know, the guy who wrote Roots and did the uh, Malcolm X autobiography was in that. Um, so it's it was interesting what took and what didn't. But for for me, I never had Democrats as the as the party of the working class. But I did remember that like people my grandparents age black are in the clan respected fdr that's wild yeah and my it was my anti-racist but republican and highly conservative catholic irish catholic grandmother who who was highly anti-racist but hated fdr it was weird so that was yeah. that's from a that's a regional upbringing thing a lot of that has to do with the fact the union like the AFL-CIO's refusal to really take a hard stance on integrating unions and stuff. And that, that, that hard stance was maintained until the like eighties um, is part of why unions never took on in the South. You could always play the races against each other. Um, and it stopped unions in their tracks, um, particularly after um, ironically, um, the end of second period, uh, third periodism, and the communists becoming friends with the Democrats and the United Front, during, with you know, with FDR. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a period liberals don't like to talk about because it makes a John Bircher's look good, but it's true. Where where Stalin said, "Okay, CPS USA leadership at least quit your hostility towards the Democrats. You know, you, um, we need a United Front against fascism because." You know, we we have to deal with this, you know, this progressive elements of the bourgeoisie um, and encourage them to work with the Democratic Party. And this led to CPUSA members like uh, Lorraine Hansberry. I, I bring this anecdote up all the time, but Lorraine Hansberry was literally having an address with Robert Kennedy on and while she was in the CPUSA. To, to influence the civil rights legislation, which everybody was trying to keep on the down low because at the same time, like the Birchers and the conservative Republicans were trying to use the CPUSA's existence and ties to the Democrats and the practical front to discredit the Democrats. So, th so there's this weird, like we, on one hand, we are working with, you know, the Democrats. On the other hand, the Democrats are trying really hard to appear anti-communist on the international stage, you know, we got to go bomb Vietnam, et cetera, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, you know, we have to, we have to out Ike Ike. Um, 
And this is a lot of the context for like in the South, what that ends up meaning is a lot of the communist party's hostility to the Dixiecrats and to the segregationist wing of the, um, of the, of the Democrats had to become internal to democratic political culture, at least officially. Um, because while they, you know, we, we want a communist revolution or whatever, we're still working with the popular front. So like, Attack Thurman, Thurman, but not directly, not as a Democrat. Like, be some like plausible deniability, right? What do you, What do you make of um, the unionization efforts with Amazon? So that's going on in the South, right? Yeah. Um. Somebody asked. I'm gonna actually clarify this question. I'll get into that a, a second. When the Marxist Worker Party says support the bourgeoisie, is, is, is it not called the Popular Front, not United Front? I may have let that slip. That's actually complicated. Um, so in parliamentary systems, the United Front means that the, the, the Socialist and Workers Party stand apart and do not join into a government with bourgeois mm -hmm. parties, but will support them on individual um individual issues so like uh, we will we will cross we will we will pass a bill with this bourgeois party um but we won't we'll, we'll raise join a coalition rate. right however that's a hard thing to apply to the united states because we're not a parliamentary system right so so we've never really had i mean trotskyists will talk about a united front strategy in the u.s but what that would mean what does that look is, like is unclear because effectively they're still voting for progressive progressive Democrats. I mean, the, to to get things done since they can't, they don't and cannot have representation in Congress. Um, so in America, sometimes I use them, but formally, the the common terms official position was um, first period United Front, second period United Front, third periodism, which is we don't work with anyone, um, we don't deal with social fascist or progressive bourgeoisie at all, and then after 1936, Popular Front. Um, now a popular front strategy have been used, um, in the Chinese context. That's why the, the, that's why Sun Yat-sen, for example, is both a major figure to both the Chinese communist and the KMT. Um, but yeah, so yeah, United Front Parliamentary Strategy in the, in Seattle City Council. Yeah, you can do it in nonpartisan elections in the United States. So it only, it only really applies to city level politics. Um, that's why I don't like talking about it that way in reserves to Marxist politics in the United States, because it's not clarifying. It took me, it took me years ago. Okay. Like I would really think about it. I'm like, so if I'm in a United front of the United States, I won't give money to the Democrats, but I will still vote for them. Right. That doesn't make sense. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, so Yeah. So the CPUSA takes a popular front strategy that the, the American SPUSA, I mean, SP, actually the American SPA takes an independent core strategy with, with, on a United Front tactic, but non-democratic centralism. And then the Trotskyist party starting with the USSWP, and then it's 85,000 split off starting in the 30s, um, takes a... United Front, but no one really knows exactly what that means. It changes what it means depending on what tendency you're in. I wasn't expecting to get in communist or Canada tonight. Um, I was expecting to talk shit about Adam Curtis, but um, in, a, in a respectful, loving way. But that's what I guess you guys come here to get the the esoteric commie deep dives. Um, so anyway, um, what that the, the way that relates to the Black Caucus and is it effectively means that you can't really oppose the Democrats, even if you're a black radical in the SPUSA, which there were a lot of black radicals in the SPUSA. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not the SPUSA, the, the CPUSA. God, the Communist Party, the, the, yeah. Stupid acronyms. All right. Um, so what does that, what does that do? Well, it just limits the, you know, you end up with with people like John Lewis, who are functionally very radical and 
have some ties to both the black power and the communist movement in a very real way through SNCC, but end up becoming more and more moderated as they get more and more into the Southern political systems and have to function in that world, make deals to maintain black representation because they're afraid if they don't, even at the expense of progressive policies, that they're going to have no black representation at all. And there you go. Um, and the way that manifests in the union movement is that the there was a big push for anti-racist policies by the CPUSA in the 20s and the 30s, independent of the Democrats and getting unionization done in the South. There was also a similar push in the in the uh, IWW. The IWW line stops dead, actually, in Appalachia. Can't get past that. And um, the ambivalence that the communists have to take after um, the Popular Front period mean that they can't really like take a diehard stand on anti-segregation because they still have to take some kind of allegiance to Democrats, mm -hmm. and it totally weakens their ability to push for um, the CAO to be more militantly unionized in the South. So the South is never unionized, even in public sector. I mean, in my state, public sector union, in my home state, not my state right now, Georgia. weirdly, yeah, in Utah, where I live now, there's a we have weirdly powerful public sector unions, but they're super Mormon and really conservative. Um, but um, so they're all Republicans. Gotcha. <laughs> like, That's um, weird. Um, so so um, in the South, they're just never unions never take on even in even in the uh, even in the in the public sector because. Like there can be public sector associations. So like as a teacher, I joined the teacher association to get insurance, but it's illegal to even threaten to strike. Um, so by, and it's illegal to call yourself a union. Um, so even though the NEA has a chapter in Georgia, it is not part of the union of, mm. uh, of the NEA national. Um, it's an association that has ties to the union. Um, but cannot strike, cannot, cannot even really do, it cannot serve as a negotiating partner. Um, all it can do is lobby. Um, wow. So, and that's, that's true for the South from like the forties on. All right. So like, um, we don't have this association of Democrats being the party of the working class because they weren't. Um, um, I mean, there wasn't, they wanted to be, they couldn't. Right. There wasn't an idea that they were kind of um, a representation of a populist sentiment that had some like progressive stuff. So like go into like William Jennings Bryant, he's a major Southern figure, right? Mm -hmm. And he's a super big progressive. He's a silver standard guy in the age of the gold standard. You know, his famous cross of gold speech. He's also a religious fundamentalist. Like he's right. the guy who argues against scopes, you know, like, um, and you see that in the bat, like if you study the tradition of the Baptist church, the Baptist church church moves from like a very working class populist, like um, even somewhat progressive organization to a hyper reactionary one between the, between the, the teens and the forties um, until like by the eighties, they're literally like, there's a third largest denomination in the country. And they're literally like uh, a, a basically affiliated with the Republican party formally. Um, so, so that history is interesting because I think because I'm Southern, I'm more inoculated to that idea. Um, I, uh, I always used to think maybe the national Democrats were, were maybe a party of workers, but I also remember thinking this William Jefferson Clinton guy is sketchy as hell and <laughs> his policies don't seem to help us much. And I thought this as a teenager. Um, so my uh, my uh, grandfather on my mother's side was a uh, he was a Democrat in Tennessee and a, uh, like a county judge of some kind. Mm -hmm. So it was like one of these odd situations where uh, I at least according to my mom, he was like virulently, virulently anti-racist. Mm -hmm. Um so we, I guess we always had that sort of tradition or some kind of association with Democrats as a progressive force. Well, I mean, 
my my thing about it is you even think about like the the six the sixties Democrats where like um Lyndon Johnson is um signing the Civil Rights Act, but the black Democrats literally can't sit in the same room because the mm-hmm. the segregationists are still in the party and and Lyndon Johnson's respecting the separation. It is it's it's like the subsane absurdity. And I like to point out, I, I saw Biden speak in Utah once. It was my first, it was like when I came back, my my um my ex-wife um is a more normal, a more normie left liberal than me. She she always thought I was a little bit insane. Um and um you know she she uh would always talk to you know she grew up in Wyoming, which is libertarian country, and she was a Democrat. So you know, I, I get it. But she'd be like, Yeah, you could meet my commie husband and um, but she, 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 as punishment, she made me go see Biden once. Um, uh, she got ticket. We had this lecture circuit ticket thing that we had won and, our, uh, won in a raffle and like paid for half of it. And Biden was coming and she's like, you're going to see Biden. And I was like, Ugh. was was this when Obama was running or no, this is, this was, I would have been out of country in Obama's second thing. Um, oh yeah. Um, cause I was gone from 2000. 10 to 2017. Um, so this was in 2018. So it was like before Biden was running for mm. president, but when he was like judging it, supposedly um, he was on the, he was on the, we have to fight Trump, but Republicans aren't really that bad. I was once friends with Brom Thurman. He was racist, but he adopted a disabled kid. <laughs> he gave that speech. Oh, oh that's good. Um, it's priceless. <laughs> I I remember thinking when he announced he was running, I was like, "It's done. He's gonna he's gonna get it." And then several, you know, I I had several bouts of delusion and denial about that, but it turned out to be right. I could tell that the that the establishment of the party didn't really want to give it to him, but they literally had such a weak backbench that they had no other option other than bernie but even bernie but even bernie yeah and but i'm gonna be honest bernie did so well in the beginning partly because the center was split like eight ways right um which is actually historically rather weird if you look at like um other like before the before the bernie phenomenon you got like the, the the like far left progressives like kucinich and and all of that there would usually be like Sinage and Cynthia McKinney and like um, there'd be like three or four progressive candidates who get like 1% of the vote. Mm-hmm. Um, but they'd also be split up. Um, so they probably were not, not as high as Bernie ever, even if you put them all together, but it probably would have been a lot closer than people realized if they weren't several candidates pulling from that. I mean, even think about John Edwards, who was, you know, kind of, kind of a uh, working class populist, and, yeah, you know, anti-racist taken out by a scandal. Right. Um, Mike Gravel. Uh, it, we can laugh at Mike Gravel. I was, I, I was on his team until he became a tried to become a libertarian and then lost to Bob Barr um, in two thousand eight. And to, you know, and then I, then I threw my lot into Bo- with Obama, and then Obama appointed his cabinet, and I felt really stupid and immediately was like black pilled um, mm-hmm. on the Democrats because I was like, I trusted you. I'm surprised. Yeah, I'm surprised you even threw your lot in with him in the first place. I I, didn't, I, was, I, I opposed I totally him in the do. primaries. I didn't trust him. Um, but I was like, okay, the symbolic of a of the first black senator. And everyone's like, he's way more progressive than he seems. Look at his voting record. I'm like, he's been in the Senate for two years. And he's done some really weird stuff. Um, he doesn't even support like gay marriage reforms. You know, I mean, he might right. believe in it, but he's not coming out for it. Um, Biden actually flanked him on it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then I saw his cabinet and I was like, we're, we're, we're fucked. Cause I was like, it's like the most conservative end. like his, his appeal to the Clinton people was to appoint the most conservative end of those people back into power. It was like watching the beginnings of the George W. Bush administration take the neoconservative branch of the Reagan administration and just reinstall it. Um, um, and I was like, we're totally fucked. I, I remember that. That was my, and and you know, I had never voted for a Democrat in my life until that point. I've never voted for a Republican in my life either. Like this is a solid it, record. 
I had a solid record of shooting myself in the foot, <laughs> but, but being fucking principled about it. Um, for you know, I, I think I voted for when the Reform Party got split between Pat Buchanan and some other guy, and and then and then Trump got involved and split it a third way. I voted for the middle option, and I voted for Nader once. Um, so I guess you could thank me for electing George W. Bush or something. Um, so yeah, that was you my know, historical record. You touched <laughs> on something that made me uh, think of. Uh, I, I, I would have thought you would have uh, been had some issues or at least been interested in uh, Curtis's use of complexity theory, because you always I talk am. about you always talk about game theory. I talk about game theory, complexity theory and, emer and emergence. And in fact, I take the 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 idea of Roy Bashkar that dialectics is actually proto complexity theory. Which is why Whoa. Um, strict, di <laughs> yeah. This is why strict dialectical. It, well, if you look at systems in history causing consistent patterns emerging from mm -hmm. opposition, where you can predict it, it makes sense, right? Cybernetics does come out of of of, of Soviet techniques, which was was which was rejected by the Soviet Union. But like um, this idea of like the human use of human beings, like Stanf uh, Norbert Wiener actually explicitly mentions like. The Soviets tried to do this to try to put labor back in as an input. They were right to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's really interesting to me. I also think that complexity theory gets you out of the we must project a unified collectivity upon a class for the class for itself and its self-distinction, um, which ends up being usually the party speaks for the class regardless of what the class says. It doesn't matter. Um, the, the party objectively knows better because, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, so on and so on. So, yes, I was interested in that. I just found it underdeveloped. Like, um, I find it very, you know, I used to work with this libertarian guy. There's a lot of libertarians in my life because I'm of the age where there was a lot more libertarians. And he was yelling at me about how, like, capitalism gave him, gave him the iPhone. And I was like, cybernetic theory comes from the Soviet Union. The flat right. screen was prototype Soviet Union. The rest of this was brought over from from uh from that theory being applied to research run by the military paid for by the government and then leased out to private corporations who also agreed originally not to compete against each other to use it um but also you know <laughs> if you're a state capitalist theorist thank you capitalism for all <laughs> <Right>. of that <laughs> i mean yeah i have a a hazy um so I, I, maybe since we're way off topic and I'm talking a lot on this one, maybe you'll find this interesting. I actually think that if you look at capitals volume one through three, and then there's surplus value, you get four basic criterion for capital. Um, one is exploitation and the other is markets. Um, the other is uh, uh, exploitation leading to reinvestment into production, not just extraction directly. Um, which is a difference. Um, and then um, uh, what's the third one? Uh, the reinvestment into uh, into reinvestment calling the need to constantly reinvest the machines because you have to put money somewhere even. Um, and thus leading to the abstractification of capital relations more and more and more over time. Um, those are four conditions. And state capitalism is relevant to two of them, but not the other two. So it is relevant to exploitation. Um, if you believe you can collectively self-exploit, which I, and if it's not democratic, it's not even self-exploitation. It's literally bureaucratic exploitation. Mm -hmm. Um, and my justification for it is if you have a party that is self-appointed and runs thing without a whole lot of democratic inputs and they can decide your enumeration in their own, how are they functionally like, no, they're not directly exploiting you, but how are they functionally different than a joint stock company? Let's try to wrap my mind around what you're saying. So, um, you're saying it's relevant to two criteria, but not the other two. Um, right. So, would would the Soviet Union would it not be applicable to them that they are re like reinvesting something like capital for the purpose? They of are, work? but they're not re. They, they also they're they're not reinvesting to make more surplus necessarily. Not so, for, not intentionally. 
Right. But they're they're competing with countries that are. Bingo. So this is the this is the second part of that that I wasn't going to get to that I was going to get to. So the Soviet Union in particular, and when people try to argue me that China is not social, not uh, so, somehow like purely socialist or something, I just fall over laughing because it's less so than the Soviet Union was. Yeah. Um. But the Soviet Union had markets, but it had a unpegged ruble that really had no relation to the international market internally. But and then it had a trading internal to the Warsaw Pact ruble. And then it had a completely third peg that was kind of free floating for the international market. So people would agree to do trade with them. Mm -hmm. This developed after after, you know, they realized that if they did autark uh, autarky forever, they would starve and have to be hyper imperialists. Um, so, so you have this weird situation where the Soviet Union is undeniably, I think, operating in it as a trading partner to compete as a state on the national market. And if you don't think that's at least partially capitalistic, I don't know what is. And, and to me, that's even more true for China. Um, because China doesn't even have, like, China does do some currency manipulations to de facto peg its stuff to the dollar. But, um, I mean, they would deny that, but everybody kind of knows it. Um, like, even, like, they MMT or... They uh, free-floating currency, right? Right. Well, they, yeah, they don't. They, it's, technically, it's floating, but it's not free-floating. <laughs> All right, so... So, like, MMTers, for example, don't list China as a country with monetary sovereignty because it doesn't float its currency. Mm -hmm. Or it doesn't truly float its currency. It's not, it's not floated on the international market for a market price. Um, yeah, not yet. Which, yeah, which is also a weird criterion for sovereignty when you think about it. But anyway. Um, um, but my point on, on that is, yes, the Soviet Union had to compete in a capitalist system and this had to act as a national capitalist if it wasn't going to autarky and when it was trying to go into autarky people starved right however unless you are an ultra left com and i have left com adjacent tendencies myself like i'm usually to the left of most trots but you you admit that mark says that there's going to be transitional periods where elements of capitalism stay around um the birth pangs right um, that comes up at the, there's some of that in the end of Capital Volume 2, and there's a, and then that's explicitly what the middle period of um, the Critique of the Earth program says. There are some left comments who say that's an eminent critique and doesn't matter. It also Marx didn't publish it. It was suppressed by Marx himself. Um, although Marx stated, the reason why Engels stated Marx suppressed it was party unity mm -hmm. and working class unity, not because, you yeah, know, I have poorly worked out my you know um but the other problem with state capitalism theory is there's like eight different versions of it about what is the yeah. criterion of which you say it's capital like for example i don't hold to the cliffite version of state capitalism i also think like the people who talk about state capitalism from the marxist humanist tradition tend to like use the nep and pretend that the nep was like eternal um and they, you know, they, they want to have the caping and eat it too on linen. Um, so I like to think about like, yes, there is there there is state capitalism. The question becomes like, was it state capitalism building towards socialism or was it stalled out? Mm -hmm. um, that is the question. Right. And, and um, uh, it is unfortunate that like the, the most anyone uh, interacts with this line of thought at all is... Un it's just like edgy ultra left comms trying to own Marxist Leninists when in, in reality it's like, no, I, I you know, I, like I will, I, like I will I'm like, saying with the intentionality thing, it's not because they're like trying to be capitalist, it's right? It's because the intentionality they're is irrelevant, right? Yeah, like this is why you can't have socialism in one country, like, right. um, you couldn't even have it in the, in the United States, which is. You know, and we're definitely talking about areas that had not had full bourgeoisification yet. And they were mostly peasant economies. I like like whatever problems you have with Bordega, Bordega points out that like in a fully developed capitalist economy, um, 
investment in agriculture and food production is like 2% of the economy. And he ended up being correct. Like that's mm -hmm. pretty much true. So, um, yeah, I, I think this is a, it's a huge bind. So when I say that, um, I don't like calling, uh, the Soviet Union state capitalist, not because I don't think a state capitalist, but because I'm trying to basically avoid a bunch of sectarian fights. Right. You're trying to get out of this conversation. Right. right. Yeah. But because, for example, when you talk about state capitalism versus deformed worker state, like those are completely different criterion. Like, I think you could be a deformed worker state and be ca state capitalist. And people are like, what? I'm like, well, all worker state means is that workers establish the state in their interest. Like it doesn't say anything about what they ends up doing. And if it's mm -hmm. deformed, which has also some weird idealistic, like pure worker state that we know already exists in platonic heaven. Right. That we could see. But even bypassing that, like um that doesn't really tell you much. Bureaucratic collectivist theory, okay. That says who became a dominant class in the system. No, they're not truly a bourgeoisie in the way we think about it, but there's a bureaucratic, there's a bureaucraticization and a bureaucratic collectivist tendency in capitalism. Like, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, so, you know, yeah, Fisher called it market Stalinism, right? Yeah, Fisher. God bless him. God bless him. Um, <laughs> Fisher could never decide if he was a Marxist or not. I know. I know. Um, I remember the in, Deleuzian. Yeah, I remember um, um, after I after me and uh, the deceased Paul Shetler published the Vampire Castle piece in North Star. Um, uh, uh, I Fisher um, went on. Fisher and I were in conversation. He also became in conversation with Douglas Lane. Douglas Lane became like kind of the agitprop person for Zero um, around this time, and then. Because because Fisher left and there's a fallout with Tariq Gargard and Fisher leaving and Fisher's depression, like there was a heartbreak and uh, Doug basically was the last man standing. He became in charge of zero. Um, but my relationship to Fisher was like we asked him, "Are you a Marxist?" And he basically said no. Um, but then when I went through his blog writings, there were times when he insisted on Marxist categories, and there are times where he had like a very British cultural notion of the working class coming out of like this, you know, um, semi-feudal caste system that kind of exists in Britain, like re residually because they still have royals and shit. Um, and he would flip back and forth when he would talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and he would admit it. Um, but his like delusionism, like, you know, delusionism is a way of saying like, I don't believe that I need to have a consistent framework. Um, like, Ultimately, like if you look at what Deleuze actually argues for in framework, that's where the critical theorists and literary theory get their whole like, we have a toolbox and we can like reappropriate any tool for any other tool. And, you know, I have to admit, there's a time when that appealed to me. Well, it, it appealed to me when I wanted to generate papers infinitely. Yeah, for sure. Be able to write about anything I wanted to. Um, and then I was like, this doesn't make any real sense. Like, and I looked at like what. You know, and I'm not, I don't say this like to disparage to losing Guitar. Guitar was some kind of like weird heterodox trot, actually, like in the French Trotskyist tradition and really took all that stuff seriously. But it, he didn't use Marxist categories in his work, except kind of in the a way of like reappropriating the Marxo Freudians into this new schizo analysis thing. <laughs> So it's always been hard for me when people are like, well, Deleuze was a trot. And I, I mean, the, I'm like, Deleuze wasn't anything. Um, um, his, he was kind of apolitical uh, or, or kind of anarchistic. And Guattari was a trot, but it doesn't seem to have had much of a influence on his writing. It's like saying that like Sartre was a Maoist, even though he rejects dialectics. Or, um, <laughs> yeah. Or, Foucault was a Maoist because he was symp symptomatic to world revolution, even though he explicitly says multiple times he's not a Marxist. Just um, applying very, he... very broad criteria. Mm -hmm. um, the issue with, I mean, the frustrating thing about Deleuze is like the most, uh, most of the people 
I come across that dislike him have really stupid reasons for it. Oh yeah. Well, some people like complain about postmodernism. Like, and I'm always like, you know, postmodernism right. isn't even a thing. Like, it's not a thing. Like, there's post-structuralism, there's the linguistic term, there's deconstruction. These things didn't agree. There's new historicism. Um Yeah, you're talking these, about specific literary and political li movements. Literary, political, and and um I think postmodernism was an arts movement, but it was mm -hmm. influenced kind of by post-structuralism sometimes. But it's also introduced by it's also highly influenced by high modernist mm. stuff like Dada. Like, yeah, like um, so I mean, in some ways, when you ask me, like, hey, can you tell me the specific difference between Dada, which is high modernist and like postmodern art? I can't even tell you. And I know the criterion. I have been trained in this. And I'm like, eh. What yeah. happened in the 1920s? The other happened in the 1960s. Right. Like. It's just periodization um, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, the mo honestly, the most uh, like the, the things that people say about Deleuze, they're just like he's trying to romanticize schizophrenia. It's it's really just that these are the most common. Yeah. Things I hear. And they're just they just have nothing to do with his work. So it's frustrating. I, what my critiques of Deleuze is more like um, when I read his work to work when he's not working with Atari, there's no consistent framework at all. Like if I read yeah. his book on almost Nietzsche, intentionally. Yeah, no, it, I think he says it's intentionally and his book on Bergson and then his stuff for guitar. I'm like, is this even the same person? Like and what here we're talking about vitalism here. We're talking about pragmatism almost and like. He has Almost a like Adam Curtis. <laughs> yeah, he is sort of like the high highfalutin jargon heavy Adam Curtis. Right. Um, I mean, but but Belouz is different than like Baudrillard. Baudrillard I have a weird respect for because Baudrillard started off as like, I'm a semiotician and a communist. And then he was like, the French communists suck. They won't stand up to the French socialists. I now believe in nothing. I'm, I'm I just can kind of respect right. that. Like, <laughs> I'm worried he's right. That's that's all I have to say about Baudrillard is I'm I'm concerned that he is on onto something. If you want to read uh you want to read something that is dangerously close to black pilling you as a socialist, um pick up uh um The Divine Left and In the Shadow of Silent Majorities, which is like his day books from from like when he's breaking with the French communist from the French Communist Party and like the oppositionary movements to it. To yeah. be like, you guys, you're just sucking up the Mitterrand. Like, you're not doing anything. You don't believe in anything. <laughs> like, you don't even it believe sound, in violence. <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like me when I read something on Twitter that upsets me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds like me when I'm like when I just get out of that or I had a debate with a with a party and I'm just like, Yeah. There's no work the work and or I read end notes and start to believe it. Um <laughs> Like it's just. <laughs> I haven't gone down that rabbit hole, admittedly. Um, uh, on on crazy on crazy things, man. Um, I am. Uh, you, do you listen to my podcast, Model Science, with uh, with Esri from um, Swamp Sides and all that? Yeah, I've listened to f a few of those. Yeah, there. I mean, there's only like seven because we release one a month. We record them way ahead of time. Like what you're getting now is literally recorded a year ago. Um, oh, gotcha. I like um, your episode on social democratic deepities. I like yeah. that. One. <laughs> yeah, this is me. I have a I have a weird I have a weird relationship to Richard Wolf because I know him. I've met him. He's a really nice man. I've seen him speak. Um, I've also read his his books with um with Resnick, and they're really mm -hmm. good. And I've looked at some of the scholarly work on like uh, single systems analysis, uh, uh, single systems interpretation of Marx. That's pretty good. I don't love his Altusarian stuff because you know me and Altusarian. But right. like, I don't know how the man who wrote the modern book on state capitalism, the like, has one of the most worked out theories on it, is a weird progressive social democrat mildly dingus Stan. That doesn't make any sense. It's because, isn't it the overdetermination thing? Yeah, it's the overdetermination thing. It creates so much ambiguity. You can't tell what's causing what. You might as well just be pragmatic about it. Yeah. But 
I also like having an eight, and, and this is not against him. Like I said, he's a really nice man. I met him. Um, but I have a distrust of Ivy Leaguers who talk, who do real talk to working class people in ways that as a working class person who's also an academic, I find super patronizing. It feels so, a little condescending sometimes. Yeah. I, I might, yeah. I, I've, I've kind of accused him of being a demagogue. <laughs> like, and I'm like, I know you have a more complex theory than what you're saying. I also know you're trying to communicate this to an average way, but you feel like you're hiding stuff from me. Like, um, I think a lot of people can pick up on that. Not, not the, they, they don't necessarily pick up on the idea that he has like some really fleshed out theory that he's not saying, but they pick up on the, if, if at the very least they pick up on the fact that he's hiding something or not being straight. Yeah. Um, so I'm getting told he's from a working class family. We can check that. Um, Hmm. Yes, sort of. His father is uh, actually was a French lawyer who, uh, in running from World War II, um, ended up losing, becoming declassé, and then having to work in a steel mill. So, kind of. Um, That's complicated, but it's complicated. Yeah. So, um, um, because he also knew Max Horkheimer person, Max Horkheimer personally. So. Oh wow. So like, yes, he is, he has experienced a working class lifestyle. Yes, he is working class because your class is related to what you do at a time. So I will give you that. But to say he comes from like a working class lineage and habitus is a little sketchy. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, this is why I appreciate why uh, you've been talking about habitus lately. Well, I mean, I, I, I really think that EO, right? Like Marxist class analysis explains the broad movement of the economy but it doesn't explain class as a lived experience for most people. And if you want to get to that class um, for itself, you really have to understand the way class is experienced, which means you have to actually look at um, Weberian, Baduian, liberal, um, Sayan, Durkheimian notions of class, because they're, they're all kind of deceptive in different ways. Yep. But they do describe a lot of ways people experience class in a kind of rigorous worked out way. Um, and I, I actually, I like to talk about habitats because it's like, how can you come from a working class culture and not be working class yourself? Like, you know, because it's not a caste. Mm -hmm. um, and how does that affect you? And like, but it is, it is, it is true because Marxists will come back to me, you know, and be like, well, you say he's not working class, but your, your childhood affects you. I'm like, yeah, it does. And you might have working class background, but man, a lot of capitalists have a working class background. Like sure. that. And in fact, if anything, the sociological studies indicate that most people with pure working class backgrounds who leave the working class or go even go up in it are some of the most reactionary people. So believe it. I mean, yeah. and I, I saw it in myself because you start believing like if I can do this one, anybody can to yeah. like look at all those degenerate tendencies and holding them back at that people can get over. And I know you can because, you know, it might not be totally their fault, but you got to work harder Twice as hard. You got to be better than those bourgeois motherfuckers. And, you know, and I get how that mentality can grow up because I, I experienced it myself. And then like realizing from my own experience of, you know, class and not being able to get out after, you know, totally did that. And, and realizing how like your habitat doesn't go away. Um, but also, you know, I was also still really, at least maybe I was labor aristocratic, but I'm a wage earner. Um, so like I couldn't survive without my job um yeah. for more than like two months so like like it's it's um it was a kind of an awakening that was like so i went through that conservatization of getting out and then going like oh wait no it's still more complicated than that like i'm still limited um yeah it's it's complicated because it it could be true in certain contexts there's often i i lapse into this the meritocracy thing Mm. Um, just thinking about certain people I know and being like, God damn it, they're so fucking smart. Why can't they? Why can't they do something? Yeah. Um. 
Uh, Joanna said in the parrot room with Doug, uh, Wolf was a little bit more candid, and I'm glad he was. I, I wasn't oh. involved in that because I'm on hiatus. But I actually asked Doug to ask us specific questions. <laughs> and I was like, don't piss him off because I, I, I really do like Richard Wolf. Like I think, I think he on the on the whole he's brought more people into Marxism than almost any of the popular Marxists I know. Even more than like David Harvey, who I have even more conflicted feelings about. Yeah. Um, but I feel like there's very much an esoteric and exoteric Richard Wolf, like. Um, and, and the exoteric one is somewhat close to, to like populist, you know, populist social democracy progressive. And then like somewhere, once you're really on the inside, you get handed the Althusser Marx Bible and like, um, <laughs> I, I mean, like, I don't think he's a cultist or anything, but I think that functionally that's how it ends up working. Um, there are worse rabbit holes to go down yeah um <laughs> oh man we've talked about so much not um then i've also probably talked more than you uh, oh that's fine uh i like to i actually i call these interviews but i used to just label them discussions because um as i get older i'm a terrible interviewer i talk almost as much and the trick to being a good interviewer actually is to like to do the give them enough work tactic, ask open-ended questions, let people go on and on and on, seize in on something that you see that they don't normally talk about, you know. And that's I know how to do I'm, that. I'm trying. That's actually what I was trying to do to you. <laughs> Smart. Um, um, but um, and that's a, also a great interview strategy. Is like you know you read the book, but you don't really understand everything, and you're just like, okay, let's get this done. But um. I like these things to be more free flowing in discussion. After all, it's a barn block. Um, Hell yeah! So let's. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of of uh, self service for both of us, um, and then maybe we'll give everyone a night because we've been on for like two and a half hours. Um, you guys are going to learn how much Doug Lane and Esri cut out of barn conversations. It's a <laughs> lot. Um, oh, that's unfortunate. Um, Ezri does not edit. My, Eddie does not. Ezri does not edit my content, and Doug does it rarely now. Um, but Ezri does cut out. Like he's like, no, she's just like he's got to stay on topic, and I'm like, I am on topic. Everything's about everything else. Like <laughs> broad scope oh, of history, everything's fair game. Yeah. Um, the uh, the. Uh, um, if you were going to have someone start off on your videos, um, where would you have them start? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I would say, uh, people, people who listen to you might like my, uh, my video called, uh, salad fingers in the fan theory industrial complex, which is kind of about the YouTube algorithm and certain problems that it mm. come up because of that. Um, people, people are typically uh, turned on to my channel uh, from the pet pet scop investigation series, which is like this seven installment long analysis of a creepy web series called pet scop, mm. um, which is way too long in hindsight. And uh, probably off topic for certain portions of it, but uh, but that is how most people find me. Um, and yeah, I've I've, I've been trying to kind of broaden the things I cover lately. Been doing a bit more live streams, and uh, I think just because of the pandemic, um, I, I've done the live stream thing as sort of like fulfilling the. It's it certainly is no replacement for socializing with people in real time, but um, it's kind of nice. And I get to arguments with people. I have found live streaming culture very refreshing. I have found social media culture toxic yep. during this time period, um, and it's weird, like how the difference is. So, and I find that the culture of weird um, WhatsApp and Discord channels to be somewhere in between depending on the day 
So, yeah. um, but since I also work at home and would only see my dog and my partner if, and you know, and and my ex wife up the street is literally the the two people and one animal um, I hang out with. Um, I would think I might go crazy without live streaming. I think yeah. when I took a hiatus from, um, I was getting burnt out doing so much for zero and I took a hiatus and I discovered with the hiatus, I immediately started Varmbog. You did. Yeah. Like it was like, so what was, was kind of weird? Me... Cause I, I saw you, I saw you announce like you're taking a break and then all of a sudden you're like putting out videos every day. So I was like, yeah, it doesn't so, seem but, like a break to me, but I'm, I'm, I'm also just, I turn the camera on and just speak. Yeah. Like, like, it's like, um, it's like I have a class and I have no topic. Um, whereas when I, uh, do stuff for I me, mean, maybe you can tell, maybe you can, if you follow me and pop the left, pop the left is not hard to do from what you guys see. Mm -hmm. Um, pop the left is me making sure that at least 75% of what I say is accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm discovering that a lot of left sources are super sectarian and wrong. And sometimes I have to turn to other languages that, that this shit should be translated in. And it's not like, um, getting the skinny on the actual voting record, um, for the early S pay day in Germany, even though it wasn't released publicly because democratic centralism means you didn't, but it was recorded like, and it's known in Germany a lot of the uh, materials in America just re just repeat um, Trotskyist lines on it, and I'm not insulting Trotskyists because they're actually usually some of the better scholars. But like they're like Wolkowski did this, and I'm like, yeah, actually he sat on his hands and didn't vote um, at all, and we actually have the record, and it's even a translated by a Trotskyist in English. Wow! But you guys keep saying the other thing. Um, because like you're citing some old research. And then when I cited that, I had this German guy. I was like, yeah, and you need to know this, 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 and this, and none of this is available in English. And so I started like, I started doing the thing where, okay, I'm going to go to the most common left source in Wikipedia, but I'm going to have to check every fucking source <laughs> and actually read it. And, um, yeah. and then I have to con st uh, summarize it down to give Doug Lane two sources that he has time to read because he's on that computer every day and making videos every day. And, and I like, he puts production values and shit in the things like, right. I just bought a web camera and a mic. Um, that's an aesthetic. It's a, it's an anti-aesthetic aesthetic. Um, right. Um, I, as I like to say, any entertainment here is, is purely coincidental. Um, <laughs> but, um, it's, it's uh, it's a very different beast. So I have to distill that down for Doug. Mm. Um, if it's a topic he already knows, and sometimes it is, I don't have to, but like that's a lot. Um, and what I was mentioning earlier, and I'll turn it back on you because I know what you're doing. Um, you're doing that thing that, that, that like my students do when they're like, Mr. Varn, ask me a question, and then they'll see if I'll just ramble for an hour and answer every <laughs> question they've ever had, but the one that the <laughs> class is about um <laughs> that's fair um but um i was about to say as far as end notes i am doing for mortal science a it'll probably end up being a six hour series but there's literally 17 hours already recorded of us going wow. through and trying to check all the claims made in end notes volume for a history of separation and go through the logic of it and go through the footnotes and go through the debates and contextualize it. And this is already recorded. Yep. But it's not edited. So gotcha. in raw footage, it's 17 hours. Esri's probably going to cut it down to about seven um, of the current. That's awesome. So it'll be a year where when you guys get it, if we release it um, monthly, like we're currently doing, it's going to be a year of me digesting and arguing with endnotes for you. Um, <sighs> Sounds good yeah. to me. Um, yeah, um, so I was talking about how communism is like uh, Talmudic scholarship. It's actually worse because in Talmudic scholarship, you have textual references. In communist scholarship, you actually have to know the history too. It's like being a Talmud scholar and a scholar of the historical reception of the Talmud. Like, um, so. 
Um, and people are like, do we need this for revolution? And I'm like, no, <laughs> dear God, no. If you have to know all this to be a to like change the world, we are utterly doomed. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that would that would mean it's never going to happen, obviously. <laughs> right. Like, because you know, I anyway. So if you are going to list three things that you love and wanted people to check out that aren't yours and not mine. Oh God. What would you tell them to check out? Spread three the thing, love. Three things that I love. I love okay. Um I think uh, Kay and Skittles on YouTube mm -hmm. is doing a very good job. Um, the recent, the recent um, video uh, about police training is transcendent, I would say. Awesome. Um, especially going into all that stuff with the, uh, I forget the guy's name, but the guy who goes around training police officers and is kind of like, the murder is good type guy. Do you know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know exactly. What you're talking. I, I listened to I I actually knew about him from from other stuff, but he's I I saw Cam Skittles and Behind the Bastards focusing on him. Um, as much as I'm complaining about documentaries and podcasts and predigested stuff. But like, I am glad that people are beginning to actually know that this was going on, because beforehand, weirdly, I think the people who I heard talk about it were libertarians mm -hmm. like. So, so yeah, that's um, awesome. It's another YouTube channel, uh, Labor Kyle. I would recommend mm -hmm. his channel. Mm -hmm. um, covers a lot of stuff, a lot of similar things um, that I cover. Um, but a lot of video games. Mm -hmm. His uh, his uh, he's got a video on Outer Worlds that I think is really good. Um, who else? Spread the love. Uh, Liz Ryerson, I've had her on my podcast. Um, she has a really, uh, it's one of these podcasts that is just perfect to listen to. It's called The Blood Zone. It's perfect to listen to if you have like two hours to kill mm -hmm. and you want to just hear someone who is really smart talk about like guided by voices and her, her, like his, her history with the band. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Just like a sprawling, like two hour long episodes that are sort of cobbled together. Um, yeah. No, oh, okay. That's that's awesome. And I I'd only really heard of one of those things. So that's 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 awesome. I'll check some of that out. Um my uh my advice to people is avoid bread tube. Um, I wish someone would have told me that earlier. Are you, are you considered part of bread tube? I don't even know. Like, how do you become God, I hope a not. bread tube? Like, you know what? Uh, I used to be a little bit put off by the fact that I was not uh, a little bit put off by the fact that I'm like, my picture is never included in the big charts with yeah. all the people in them. And now I'm Mine like, either. No, now I'm like, whew. No, I was actually the other. I think I posted like on Twitter. I was like, "Am I have I avoided the indignity of being part of BreadTube because I am willfully obscure?" I don't. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I don't know how you manage that, but it's it is because you're so critical of leftists. Yeah, that's probably it. Um, I mean, I've even met Peter Coffin in person. So oh no shit, it's all at the same time. So we had like the great zero books collab and. Um, for the, the Jordan Peterson debate, it never happened. Richard Wolf showed up and met him finally. Oh, right. Um, I remember you know, that. I mean, I met a lot of people when I was abroad too. Like, I, like, um, Zizek was in town. I, I met him. Mm -hmm. Um, um, like I got to shake his hand and move on. Um, cause in Korea, he was like super famous at the time. He even like had a, with the time I was leaving, he was like doing partial stints at Korean universities. Um, hilarious um and i've met uh i met andrew Kleiman, who called me a mccarthyist later but like we had dinner in korea <laughs> um um and i've met bob black and some of the weird the, the weirder end of anarchism i know mm -hmm. some of those guys i had a crime black, like and prim guy 
Yeah, he's not totally am prim, but he's am prim uh -huh. friendly. Yeah, he's this guy who who basically led a twenty year civil war of a, of three thousand pages against Murray Bookchin, like like the and was the part of the first round of the use of post left, or maybe even the second round actually, because the first round was actually left communist in the fifties or something, mm -hmm. but. Um, so this current like social de democratic right wing ish stuff is all like it's it's post left round four or something. <laughs> um, it's somehow worse than the others, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I, I also think I'm, I'm more associated with podcasting actually, and like only recently yeah. started doing YouTube. Um, but I'm critical of leftist, I try to be. Um, I try to be unfocused and, <laughs> um, and I also, I, I hate Twitter beefs. Like, like a lot of the, our uh, YouTube beefs, which I think are just the virtual extension of Twitter beefs. Uh, although yeah. I probably actually predate them, but, um, yeah. Like response videos were a thing even like yeah. 10 years ago. Right. Um, I remember like in like 2007 watching the angry atheist do responsible videos to yeah this that or the other um but um it's yeah bread tube don't get involved in bread tube it'll ruin your life um it's bad folks um all right well it's liberal yeah to the extent that it's coherent yeah um american johnson would probably be down it would make the most sense um I'm just reading now what our peeps are saying. Um, yeah, you know, you know what? I'm going to talk about, you know, Red Tube is, is rad liver anarchist. I miss a certain kind of anarchist. Like, where's the, like, where's the rain prices of the world? And, um, and uh, the platformist and, and uh, even someone like Ron Tabor, who's like, an anti-Marxist, but is like a pretty consistent writer on socialism. Like, why did we get stuck with like the, or even like Michael Albert or somebody like, or, or you know, somebody like that who I don't really love and associate with the old um, battle for Seattle uh, style of, of anarchism. Um, Albert's, uh, is, he's the Paracon guy. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. But I associate him like way back, like when I was when I was radicalized, my first my first trip into the radical left, you know, as a zinester was to go cross country to Seattle for the battle for Seattle when I was a senior in high school. Um, and I saw Pat Buchanan speak there like wow. weird. Um, but also I didn't meet them like that crew, like the Michael Albert crew. But like that to me was like the the introduction to what the things like David Graeber, but then you get like, I don't know, I'm friends with some of these people, but like these MMT chartalist anarchists mm -hmm. are like anarcho Naomi Kleinism. Like it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah. I, 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 Kevin Carson, even the people from like the mutualist, like center for a stateless society, which they used to be like, I knew some of them from my my paleo conservative times that they were like adjacent to us. And uh, they were always like, rah, rah, anti-war. We can have a left, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, Murray Rothbart, pro-market anti-capitalism. And I was like, <sighs> I mean, I guess you can have market socialism. It's theoretically possible, but no. But, but they were pretty rigorous at least and, mm -hmm. and somewhat morally consistent. I don't get the current batch of, of, uh, <laughs> anarchist that much. The, really uh, everyone don't. you just cited, I mean, at least the people I know from the other people are like infinitely more coherent, infinitely more, uh, just, uh, scrutinous, uh, about their arguments. Have you read, um, any rain price? I have not. Uh, Wayne Price wrote, wrote probably one of the best introductions to basic Marxist economics for like we babes. And he it's, it's, it is literally called like 
political, you know, political economy for anarchists. And it's like, or I think it's one of the, and it's, it's just breaking down that he also has a, a book that you can find online for free because anarchists are pretty good about that. Mm -hmm. Um, legally, um, it's different theories of the class nature of the state where it goes to the different anarchist theories of the class nature of the state and the different Marxist theories and where they agree and disagree. And it's actually some of the best scholarship on that I have read. Um, he was, uh, he was, he was part of the Hal Draper, um, breakaway oh, okay. from the ISO, um, and the, the, the youth revolutionary league. And then he broke with that too. Um, but he's still kind of, he, he, he's sort of like an anarcho draperist. Um, so he's highly influenced from Marxist political economy. Uh, he thinks Marxism is too, he thinks the Marxism, Marxist transitional forms end up getting bogged down and, you know, impossible to defend. So, so some of his arguments are actually very similar to Lefcom arguments. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, very interesting guy. And if that was the face of anarchism in America, it would be interesting. <laughs> we might be in better shape than we are now. I think the face of anarchism in America is Vosh. Oh, good Lord. Um, uh, Vosh considers himself an anarchist, right? He does. Or, well, okay. He says libertarian socialist, but you know. That's uh, usually it, code word for either anarchist, right. rad lib, or I don't want to say. Right. But off, I mean, oftentimes he's just defending social Democrats, so. Well, I mean, I don't know. I see a lot of people who are real Marxists who spend a lot of time defending social Democrats. That's so true. I don't know anymore. That's very um, it, it, I, uh, I have, I'm trying to keep myself honest about that. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a hard place to be, right? Like, there are times where I'm like, why are the Marxists getting showed up by some Cretan like Jimmy Dore? Yeah. Um, like, why are these old Gen X hacks and basically... Like some of whom are frankly like um like I've liked Green Greenwald's writing on foreign policy most of my life. But if people thought he was a leftist, I remember when he was invited to speak at the socialism conference when the ISO was running it, and I was like, What the hell is he doing there? I discovered him on LouRockwell.com like like um in two thousand five, back in the whole like we're going to have the left liberal alliance and paleo cons and, and, um, and this and that, we're all going to get along because we're anti-war, which um, I remember recently just laughing at someone. Cause I was like, you know, the whole like paleo con alliance with um, radical Marxist and stuff was sort of tactically defensible on anti-war grounds. Sure. It makes no sense when your sole goal is to own the libs like that's the thing yeah that's that's where you run into trouble is your your hatred of liberals just over it just overpowers everything i i, I think this is a pitfall and and frankly it's one i think i almost fell into at certain points but oh i um, i have fallen into it in my point i remember when i wrote my uh general critique of liberalism and like and even like it's always been like i've always had this like we're the loyal opposition to modernity we we come out of like marxists do come out of liberalism but unlike yeah. the rest of of the political spectrum other than fascists who just who want to have their cape and eat it too and like negate it but also use its benefits we are trying to transcend it and make it like be more than itself by opposing a lot of it right like Mm -hmm. Like Marx starts off as a liberal and becomes something else. Um, Our goal and, should be to fulfill the promises of liberalism. Right. Which they can't fulfill. Right? right. And they never will be able to. But, but I remember like, even when I was young in the, in the paleo conservative days and I'll be like, everybody'd be like, we're a classical liberal. I'm like, who's not uh, like from the understanding of liberalism as, as coming from the enlightenment in some way, even like the decolonizing people are, in some ways, I mean, if you read Chinua Achieve, like you can't get out of it. Like we have to use nation states. I'm like, we're all descendants of liberals, unless yeah. you're like somebody who believes you can reinstall a Habsburg emperor, and like Those under un exist, they do, and they don't usually matter. So they don't. Like, <laughs> They're funny. Uh, yeah. 
I mean, it's it's uh, one of those things where it's just like, like, yeah, if you want to, which is why I don't throw, I used to throw the word liberal around all the time, but I've even said this on uh, Twitter and on Facebook. I don't like it as much anymore because it's almost universally true because at some level we are all reacting, responding and growing out of liberalism. And in some ways, the the liberal form of liberalism is is got the least relationship now to its historical antecedent. And like it's gotten it's, you know, um, I hate to use the progressive regressive context that I inherited from my Spart Platt days. But mm-hmm. but um there is a sense in which like mainstream liberalism is stuck in such a way that it's inverting in on itself in a way that like Marx describes um, the liberals doing during the Brumaire and, you know, the party of order, like degenerating into the party of order and all this, you know, and the the two kinds of monarchists, like you you just get stuck in that way. Um, And so, but I also don't like this whole like Marx, there's another tradition that comes out of a lot of, a lot of the um, less orthodox trots um, where like, no, you know, Marxism is a real liberalism. And that seems to lend you down the road of like spiked and accelerationism. And, and like, we have to build up productive capacity by being as liberal and free market as possible. And also heighten the contradictions by making things shittier. And it seems like especially attractive right now. Yeah, you know, I think after, I I think like so, social democratic losses. You know, there's no real leftist movements to speak of. Acceleration. I was, um, I mean, that seems like why not? I I mean, I I'm gonna say something that might be super blackpilling to a lot of the people who were Biden DSA, not Biden Bernie. See, I'm even slipping in my head. Right. Um, yeah. I was like you know, big on the whole, like, we can support Bernie, but don't be deluded. Even if he wins, we're in deep trouble. Like, like you didn't transform the nature of the democratic party fast enough. There's no leverage and means of holding these people accountable and fighting against donors. There's no way that you have enough squad members to act as who be, who are structurally incentivized to, to turn coat the way moderate, um, moderate to conservative Dems can, because they can just change party if they want to. And the progressives can't, um so um you know like i have actually like we're like mitterrand light like we didn't even get to screw up by actually ruling like shitty liberals um yes you know i tell my story a, a couple of times and uh maybe people find it interesting part of my journey into communism was actually how bad the conclusion to naomi klein's the shock doctrine was okay that's that makes sense because i read the i read the shock doctrine and i'm like okay one why are you blaming these libertarians i mean there's in some way that they're structurally responsible but like you're making it sound like they're a conspiracy theory for the libertarians to impose shock on in iraq when all the people that you're citing literally opposed it um but okay, even even taking a structural argument, which you don't do, you then spend more than half the book going through the Peronist and social democratic movements in Latin America, and Mitterrand and Solidarity in Poland, and documenting that they neoliberalize more than even the Pinochet government because there's not as much left opposition because they are the official left in power and because they have to. And your answer at the end of this is we need a less ideological, more, more super like Kane, like vague Keynesian bromides. It's not even like worked out post Keynesianism or MMT or even steam Keen level shit. It's like, it, it's like weird. And I read that book and I'm like, you just proved to me that social democratic reform movements in a capitalist context don't work. Right. And your response to that is, let's just do more of that. Naomi Klein. Seriously. And um, I remember when Bosch Constant Carr wrote his anarcho-liberalism article, which I find hilarious now. I'm, I'm getting dangerously close to talking shit about friends of friends of mine. But um, I read that. 
Um, it's a good. <laughs> I didn't know that was out there. It's good, but I, it, like it could be aimed directly at Nathan Robinson, so Boshkar wouldn't write it now. Um, mm. And it does mention like Naomi Klein by name, and like now they're all on Team TSA. <laughs> so I'm just like. I'm so like, weird. oh man, there's there is there is a there is a structural pull to engaging in the Democratic Party on their terms. That's yep. even worse in the United States because we don't have a parliamentary system, and our responses historically yep. were based on parliamentary engagement or non-engagement, and then and revolutionary. It's not impossible to have a third party. Yeah. Um, so. So you know that's that's where I am, and like there are some groups that I think have real. I mean, there are even some Mao's groups, I think, not the most popular ones, but um, Mao's groups and definitely some Trotskyist groups that still exist. Although Trotskyism outside of some Trotskyism worldwide is like liquidating itself right now. It's very strange and concerning to, for me to watch. And literally, it looks like the only surviving tendency are going to be the two opposed forms of Orthodox Trotskyism, the um, uh, Ted Grant, uh, Alan Woods. Um, um uh souls version um the imt and then like the sparks um because uh marciites are all stalinists now and they're literally trying to rewrite their history that they were never trots um you can like i watched the edits happen to sam marcy's page on uh on wikipedia it's kind of funny um he was a marxist leninist who was part of the swp but so you know and he was a tanky but he was a trot tanky Mm -hmm. Um uh <laughs> is it um are, are it, is it Trotskyists who are in charge of uh Marxist.com or something like that? Marxist uh, uh, I think that in defense of Marx um is is run by the IMT. Um so um I don't know who's got Marxism.com. Um I still think I was, hey, Marx I was, uh someone tried to recruit me. That's the reason I'm asking. Oh uh maybe, maybe the IMT but my only um the IMT right now seems to be adopting a strategy of um let's try to do to the DSA what the DSA is trying to do to the Democrats. But because the uh, DSA is not a bourgeois party, maybe if we enter it, there's a chance that it could become something like a workers' party. Um, the hurdles are smaller. They are smaller. Um I think it's I don't think it's structurally likely to work, but I think it's a little bit more defensible than what the DSA is trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, Cause the DSA is trying to like, we're not Heron tonight's anymore, but we totally are. They are. Um, yeah. um, so, you know, but as, a, as an aggregate effect, they are, there's chapters with all sorts of weird idiosyncrasies, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have the, uh, the the fact that like oppositional to China Maoism, which was the mainstream of Maoism until until very recently, it's also been liquidated for the most part. Um, and so Maoism is increasingly like neo Maoism defensive Xi's interpretation of Dingism and um, standing for for like Russia sometimes in weird ways. Um, and uh, there are a few of those old Maoist groups left, but I think a lot of they, a lot of them, have entered into the DSA milieu, kind of like the Greek version entered into Syriza, and that didn't go so well for the Maoists who entered into Syriza. I just want to point that out. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. I think we're. But what you're seeing in the DSA is now the DSA like has the same weird sectarianness that we, and I'm pro tendencies like i'm I, I think all the weirdo tendencies have to be like that's part of what a real marxist movement has to deal with we have to have all of our weird shit somehow mm -hmm. under the same tent but Absolutely. there's got to be space for it um but um uh it's uh there is a way in which within the dsa there's now the same spectrum of things that used to exist outside of the dsa as 50 different groups now it's 50 different confederated chapters and caucuses who still effectively mostly give money to Democrats. Right. So, I mean, you know, what do you do with that? I don't, I don't know. Um, you have to plan some kind of coup. But the whole dirty break thing is interesting though. Like, so you have this dirty break idea, right? 
but you're saying it out loud to a party with more money, more resources, and more experience doing the kind of shit that you want to do, and more ability to corrupt progressives. And I mean, I like to point this out, and people hate it when I do, but in the 80s, Nancy Pelosi was a similar figure to AOC. Yeah, for sure. Like she was the head, she was the most progressive wing of the progressive caucus. In a time, actually, in the 80s, Democrats are to the left of the 90s Democrats. So, like, uh, like with respect to what you're talking about in DSA, uh, there's a tendency to just undermine, uh, uh, to underestimate Democrats. Yeah. And then, and then be weirdly like, it's funny because I'm like listening to like a lot of the DSA people who get attracted into the post left sphere. I don't know how real big it is. I know it has a pool of a lot of people who are alienated from from leftists and for, for reasons I think are legitimate, actually. But um, like they talk about like I remember reading this Shreyuna article, you know, with the with the Swede saying <laughs> that like, you know, in America, they used to believe in the working class and the Democratic Party under Sanders. Like and I was like. No, like, like, yes, there was some, there was some noblesse oblige from like the Warren camp, but like the Elizabeth Warren camp was a hyper minority camp until very recently. Mm -hmm. Like, where have you guys been? Like the Democrats have not even kept their promises to the unions who are like 90% of their lobbying force. Like, yep. Like they haven't even tried to claim that they were interested in the working class since like the mid eighties. They started switching to talking about the middle class all the time. Like right. it's like, it's weird. Cause I feel like there's this retrospective like creation of a recent. And so one of the things I've been doing when this, doing this Christopher Lash book is doing, checking his history out and realizing this problem is it's not even, it doesn't even emerge around the time of the new left. It goes back to the thirties. Like, um, Basically, progressivism tries to progress. Progressives coming from elite backgrounds actually actively try to pick up populist, socialist, and even fascist technocratic ideas to revitalize like their ideology. And it starts under under Teddy Roosevelt and accelerates massively under FDR. Um, and basically, because of things going on internationally, because of um, electoral failures because of what happens to the Debs in 1917 and 1919, um, because of the weird pivots in the CPUSA, because populist the populist movements keep on being progressive at first and then degenerating into weird nativist conspiracy theories. Um, that that it's basically a problem since the 30s, since you since like there was a, a real active co option of parts of um you know the reformist parts of some of the, the socialist and populist ideas but also to use to actively suppress them um and to co-opt them and to neuter highly effective know. yeah and it worked and and that's a history that that goes back like in the u.s like people like try to like you'll even see like you know communists now like oh the problem is like you know the the new left it's no, that problem was why the new left came into being. Actually, like, like it was a response to a similar problem that already existed. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's an interesting. It's an interesting thing. I know, and and what's with some? We, there's a lot of American inks put on like um, uh, the Trotskyists because the Trotskyist did represent overwhelmingly after the Cold War the the non recalcitrant part of the communist movement so most of the mm -hmm. cpusa people abandoned communism altogether like um like i think about harold cruz and all those guys um are they stay communist but they're highly ineffective and they die young um um so it's uh it's a very interesting sort of milieu and there is like the, the SPUSA exists. It's technically one of the two successor organizations to the SPA. Um, and the SPA was the only real mass um, socialist party in the United States. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the communist party was pretty big, but the, the at its height, um, the, in the, in the teens, the SPA was like three times the size of the communist movement. And that was, uh, uh, was that Debs? Yeah, that's Debs party. I mean, so you're talking about a party with a formal membership of, of a huge amount, um, of a couple hundred of several hundred thousand in a time when the U S population is like, what, a third of what it is right now. Mm-hmm. And, um, and notice I said several hundred thousand, not several tens of thousands, like all the socialist movements after it had been. Um, and uh, it also controlled like 17% of the vote. So it's the closest socialists have gotten to the real mechanisms of power in the United yeah. States. And so, you know, Wilson makes sure Debs goes to prison for opposing World War II and that pretty much that and the what I like to think of as the third or fourth Red Scare, though it's often called the first Red Scare, um, after the Bolshevik Revolution and the Bolsheviks' own not wanting to deal with the SPA and playing a bunch of different parties in America off of each other. Zinoviev did this, led to the SPA like basically being useless for like and existing as a weird rump party. Um, what and, you know, while Max Chapman, when he breaks with Trotskyism, um, like marches it straight into the Democratic Party and dissolves it. But in the late sixties, and Her- Harrington and Shackman dissolve it. Um, yeah. And then um, the SPUSA is formed. I forget who forms it as the as the will run our own candidates standard on you know be independent, um, take a united front policy. But we're also not going to be subservient to Moscow. Um, we're not going to be part of the common turn. Um, which didn't exist at this point anyway, but it was a theoretical ban on democratic centralism um, that exists as kind of like a small party of about five to 6,000. It's slightly bigger than the DSA. And the Harringtonite DSA is like 5,000 in the 80s and like stays that size until it explodes, um, you know, seven years ago. Um, it, it was kind of a wake up call. Uh Someone is saying DSA cheats by including members who haven't paid their dues in years. I think that's probably true. I think also um, what you it was a wake up call for me when you pointed out that the uh, Communist Party of Japan is bigger than DSA. Like, yeah, b- by by uh, by an order or, of magnitude. Or, yeah, exactly. Uh, by the way, the Raelians in the in the two thousands are five times the size of the DSA now. Also, they're more fun, I think. Um, you know, a hundred a hundred k in a party that's supposed to be a mass party in a in a country that has three hundred and fifty million, right? Um, and that's the DSA big. policies have some effectiveness if they can ever interact with them. But I hate to say it, but the more like the more if, if you got people like Jimmy Dore like able to just run circles around you, quoting you at yourself. And the dude is like, I know I'm going to have a a friend of mine is going to come in and like shame me for like, you really agree with Jimmy and you used to always talk about the Britain to protect yourself. But like the dude's politics is, is like, is good on like three things. And then it's like Chris hedges and like, and that's it. And like, it's, it's very much like, you know, if we have to make concessions to right wingers to get this done, and I'm like, hmm. Right. That's um, that's where you lose me. Um, but it's it's really embarrassing because when he's just quoting like AOC out of herself, it's kind of convincing. Like it's just like um, I mean, you know. If someone like Jimmy Dore can make you look bad, that that's a bankrupt project. Yeah. I mean, and and you just like how can the DSA hold? How can the DSA have the accountability structures greater than the than the DNC to hold these people accountable? And since and even like game theoretically, like okay, this is where I disagree. This is actually where I disagree with Jimmy Dore because Jimmy Dore is like they could stop it and they could outweigh you know Joe Manchin. I'm like no, they can't because everyone knows they can't go anywhere. Joe Manchin yeah. can go to Republicans. It wouldn't work. Right. It, it would. It, they would. It, they would be they would be blamed for taking down the bill and you get nothing exactly um so the entire gambit never made sense like if you game theoretic it out you didn't do the work to make to even make it possible for them to be 
um, successful. And I mean, I, I, you know, I think eventually they're going to become more and more like conventional policy. You already see it actually, um, particularly on foreign policy issues where they just automatically defer to the democratic security stuff, despite whatever they say on Twitter, like automatically. Um, and you saw a disproportionate amount of ink spilt by like Corey Black and co on um, trying to get rid of all the Republicans who voted against the Republic or whatever. And I'm like, you realize that if you did that, um, they're not going to let you do that. Like, like you'd have several states who had no representation in Congress of that, that had legitimately elected things that had been invoked in a civil war. You do that if you want a civil war and you don't, I know you don't. So, you know, you're not going to do this either. This is, mm -hmm. this is, this is a, it's a lot of bluster, right? It's it, a lot it's of bluster. Good, good sound bites. Um, so it's it's uh what are you gonna do? What are you um, gonna do? I yeah. It I've what I've been saying on my stream is like I am at, at the very least, I think I'm kind of asking the right questions. Yeah. I think I am comfortable. Well, not comfortable, but I am intense on staring into the abyss and not not humoring these easy answers that people are and it's just for comfort people are attached to this it's just for purely for comfort's sake it Have seems you, to me are you familiar with terror management theory um not really so a lot of terror management theory is based off of the idea that because we're all afraid we're going to die one of our one of our ways of living on since we're all secular now, even if we don't say we are, um, mm -hmm. is through the projection of our our, our ideology. Um, sure. But what, what how that actually ends up functioning is actually kind of the way Marxists would say it would function, right? Like you're instead of like changing your ideology to reflect you, you change yourself to reflect the ideology mm -hmm. because I guess you can live on better that way or whatever. Um, I think. I think, you know, structural economic impulses aside, and I, I, I think those are all important. Like, I'm still a Marxist, but I think the individual investment on this works basically on this idea that we defend our ideas because we're really defending our own existence beyond ourselves. And, and we have our ideas actually as an extension of like that and an extension of symbolic kinship. And so there's a way in which when you tie that into class ideologies also playing into this and social reproduction, you have several different systems which really reward prior investment and doubling down um, as a kind of dopamine hit, but are completely useless for actually like overcoming the condition. And I don't, like I said, I, um, I'm doing a video for zero books on class for itself and in itself. It'll come out tomorrow actually. Um, nice. So, so today is um, March 14th, so it'll be out on March 15th from zero. But I talk about, um, I don't like the use of false consciousness because it's so easily abused, but that's what it means. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you can substitute these ideas. And somebody was like, somebody told me on, I think it was a comment on, on YouTube, actually. They're like, well, you know, a lot of working class people have uh, reactionary ideas. Um, so, but, you know, they're sincere. They believe them. That... So you can't really call it false consciousness. It's not like they're fooled. And I'm like, I don't, one, that's not what false consciousness isn't a conspiracy of someone to fool you. And two, right. um, which is why I don't, because it implies it, the way people use it imply that it does. I don't really like talking about it that way. But two, the, um, the other thing is, I'm not even sure that that's even the primary form of false consciousness amongst leftist or working class people like i'm also think a lot of progressivism yeah, totally is a false consciousness totally totally yeah <laughs> i mean oh my god 
Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I kind I do kind of shirk at the um, well, I certainly I'm pretty self-conscious about saying the term false consciousness to my audience. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it is it is one of these cases where you have to think about, OK. Wh- what is this person's does this person have a, an objective like economic interest in the system and are they operating in a manner that's consistent with that. I think and, I, yeah, I think that's, that's one way, but I also think this terror management stuff gets into the ways that people think seem irrational that seem don't, don't have like an economic interest, but people still double down. Um, it's because it's sectional ego protective, yeah. um, you know, and then you interpolate that to use an Altisarian term, even though I hate Altisair and there's someone in the commentary is going to come on and try to correct me in a week or two weeks or something um, um, that, uh, that, you know, that punks is, that has this play out. It's not that people are like, you know, it's always funny. Cause I always hear this stuff about, well, the Americans all believe they can become millionaires and working class people don't believe that everywhere else. One, it's not true. Actually, the attitude of working class in most people actually remarkably resembles America, except where they have, fairly developed social democratic forms and actively educate on working class culture. Um, that's not unique to the United States guys. It's really not. Um, you're not that special. <laughs> the United States doesn't, I mean, yes, there's a hegemon. Yes. There's a lot of distortions here. And then that gets, but like, you're not that unique. <laughs> like, I've traveled the world. I can tell you, you're not that unique. Um, the, You're not even whole, uniquely um, stupid. You're incredibly fucking average. That's like <laughs> I've had I've had long uh, conversations with people in DS back when I was active in DSA, and uh, I had this one guy straight up tell me, uh, very much like a uh, ardent Bernie supporter, mm-hmm. uh, firmly like a social democrat, and self aware about it, which is kind of rare because a lot of them are like, no, we're socialists. We're, uh, you know, we're social Democrats or, or we're uh, democratic socialists like Bernie. Right. Um, but he straight up told me, he's like, I wouldn't support a revolution because it's not in my interest. It wouldn't it wouldn't benefit me. I'm living comfortably right now. And that was kind of eye opening for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's uh, a lot of it. Although it's it's also interesting how historically that's also not always true. I mean, like if you have a very vulgar view of class consciousness, you can't explain like how the hell did Ingalls happen? Like, right. Like, um, also Marx wasn't really working class himself. Um, he was from a artisan family and a lawyer and rabbis, um, lawyers, so his grandfather was a rabbi. His father converted to Christianity to be to be to, to do law. Um, he was trained. He actually trained. He was really close to his dad too. I, I've been reading Marx's biography now, and I was actually surprised he didn't break with the legal tradition or with liberalism until his father died. Um, is this was, Heinrich? Um, no, this is uh, the uh, the scholar um, um, uh, Marcelo Mosto. I'm also reading Heinrich. I'm reading. I'm reading. Actually, I'm going to right now reading as many Marx biographies as I can find and trying to take note of where they contradict each other. Yeah. Um, because I I have this like everyone's always telling me you got to contextualize Marx in his political life. Well, I'm like, well, you have to contextualize him in every element of his life. Um, but I don't trust any one document to do it. So now I'm like on the great, like how many Marx biographies can I read? So I'm going to read to Heinrich. Heinrich has, Heinrich's very good on, on philological and Marxological work. Some of his interpretations of Marx is actually kind of weird. Um, but I'm going to read his biography and I'm going to read um, Scherber's, who was released by Verso. I'm going to go reread that weird Isaiah Berlin one. I'm going to reread the Francis Wien one, which is really obnoxiously liberal. I'm going to read the the Loving Capital one that's about him and his wife. I'm 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 and I'm reading um Musto and then I'm going to read the there's I think three autobiographies of Ingalls in English. One by um uh 
the Terrell Carver, who's a, a scholar at Idaho, actually, he's part of the mega oh, project wow. on the Ingalls side of things. Um, he did the brief introduction to Ingalls, and he makes a pretty compelling argument. Marx and Ingalls are pretty close, but they aren't actually exactly the same. It is neither the, they're totally copacetic as some MLs and even some Neokowskis believe, nor is it the left comms and the academics who tried to like, well, Ingalls corrupted Marxism argument. Like it's pretty clearly, they're really close, but there are subtle differences. Um, and so I'm reading those two to kind of contextualize it all. I'm also reading like the standard biography of Marx, which is, uh, uh, of of Ingalls, which is the uh, Mar I forgot who wrote it at the top of my head, but it's Marxist General. Um, uh, so hopefully in a year, I'll be able to say more about these contextualizations because so far I've been relying on Trotskyist pedagogy, a little bit of Maoist pedagogy that I got in my sectarian days, and reading. Hal Draper and reading sporadically in the historical materialism series. <laughs> so like now I'm like systematically trying to do that, but I'm also trying to write a book on Christopher Lash with Shalom Van Tine. I'm also probably trying to write a book with uh, PH Higgins on um, the Italian communist influences on pop the left, the original run um, and how we, how we kind of develop beyond that. Um, Dang. And I'm also writing two or three books of poetry and I have a day job and I'm doing these things every day. It's insanity. Um, yeah, I'm a nerd. Sounds like it. Uh, that, I mean, the whole, just the Marx biography thing is incredibly ambitious. I'm slogging through uh, Heinrich's intro to the three volumes of Capital right now and that's about as far ahead as I can look. So when people ask me about reading Capital, I always tell them to do the following, and this is a real dick thing to do. But I'm always like, okay, get capital, read it, all three fucking volumes before you start talking. There's some people who know I'm talking about them right now. Um, read it, then read Mandel's footnotes, then read Harvey, Heinrich, Kleiman, um, and Ben Fine. They do not agree, but you like, I'm not one of those people who thinks you can't, you, you don't need to deal with secondary literature, but you need to deal with opposed secondary literature. Mm -hmm. So, but read it first on your own, try to make sense of it on your own, then read the, and maybe you can throw in Jameson's weird literary reading of it. If you feel and like all two Sarah's reading capital. I mean, you know, I, I tell people that to like humor them, um, <laughs> But um, it's like what you're doing with the biographies. See where they disagree. Right. Yeah, see where they disagree. See what that tells you about their perspectives. Then come back to it, read it again, do it on your own. Do I expect everyone to have to do that? No. But I expect people who are going to teach this shit to other socialists, to simplify it, to spread the gospel of Marx or whatever, you have to train. Like, and you have to be rigorous. Um, yeah, I, I think there is something to that. Uh, you, you mentioned, I, I can't remember where it was, but discipline. Yeah, <laughs> you have to be a disciplined reader. I mean, like, are, and, and also not just a reader, because there's also a sense where like you have to be looking, dealing with the empirical sciences. This is one thing I hate. Like Marx did not argue by citation. Mm hmm. Like, the, like, yes, there's tons of, like, you read, like, the economic and philosophical managers, there's tons of citations in it, because there's fucking notes. They were written as notes. Um, but when um, Marx goes and sets out things in Capital, he makes a lot of abstract arguments, but he's also, he's spending time in the, in the London library literally poring over the empirical documents at the time, and then comparing them to what he's getting from Ricardo and Smith, and trying to, like, parse out categories and make it make sense with actual inputs and also reading back in the shit going all the way back to the debates on it going to Aristotle. Which right? I think like how, how infinitely easier it is now to do that. Yeah. Like you don't have to go and spend all this time and like, look, you can, you can get a VPN. Right. And I'm not going to tell you to do this, but you could theoretically get a VPN, go find these books somewhere for free on the internet. Even if, 
even if you need to look at them in another country, legally in that country. And um, you can do this on your own for almost, for pretty much the only cost is your time. Your time and however much your internet costs. Yeah. I mean, so there is a cost and there's a, there, there's a time. Time cost is real. But yeah, um, for sure. And not everybody can do this. And I don't expect this is like when people when people when I talk this way, people think I'm telling everybody in the world to do this. Like you need to do this to be a Marxist. And that's like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like People get really but, defensive about this. Yeah, right. Like, but if you're going to teach this, if you're going to act as an authority on these ideas, you have to have the same rigor as an academic would mm -hmm. because you are taking upon yourself a similar thing now i think we need street academics i mean like i do i think like hal draper is my model for this he taught himself this stuff he went and dug through the archives he you know, like the guy was like a steel worker all right he was not a scholar until he became a scholar on his own but he was rigorous about it um he was also a weird sectarian and had his own history right but like he was rigorous about it and, and i think from the time period you wrote one of the best books contextualizing um, Marx's writings in regard to his politics that was available in the 70s. And that's the five volume Marxist history of, of, of Mar the Marxist theory and history of evolution or whatever, volumes one through five. Um, and just reading that is probably a year long undertaking because that's what it took me and I read fast. But that was my model for how you do this. And also thinking about like, how do I go about learning like literary criticism where I read a I read an interpretation, I read a counter-interpretation, I compare it to the empirical notes, I do the contextual research and the historical research, and then I come back and then I can draw a conclusion from it. Um, you, you have to kind of do that if you're going to try to do this. You can't, I'm sorry, even though I'm a person making fucking YouTube videos, you can't listen to my YouTube video and go and talk authoritatively on the shit I'm talking about. Like, mm -hmm. I shouldn't even either, um, frankly. Um, but you can start there, use that to get the grounds and figure out if this is something you want to develop part of your life in. And one of the reasons, like, I totally like dig the idea of socialism is eventually the idea is you're, we get socially necessary labor time down enough that everybody would have the option to do this to their, to their natural capacity. Like, yes, like you still think, have to work, but uh, yeah, I, and I would like to think if, if you are living in those conditions, you're going to have a goddamn renaissance, yeah. the likes of which you would never has never been experienced in human history because the arbitrary constraints on people's ability to develop themselves would be removed. Exactly. And like, I'm not an abstract egalitarian. I think that's a waste of time. But like. You know, that's a very weird liberal notion that like Marx takes the hash in like 30 seconds in the Kriku Gertha program. Even if you think about from each their own ability to each of their own needs implies human difference and inability in sure. certain things. Um, but the idea is we we don't make living dependent on selling your wages to someone to make more produce for them so you can get by. And by removing that hindrance and making you know, labor socially necessary are voluntaristic. So you do the labor we need to do. And then all other labor beyond that is because you want to do it. Um, yeah. I think you're right. You see a lot of stuff open up. Um, you I see actually see an explosion in technology, art. Yeah, I would, hope so. I would hope so. And I mean, because this idea that like people wouldn't work if you don't if you don't make them work by a wage is weird to me also because most of human history doesn't function that way. Yeah, it's ahistorical. Um, <laughs> I like the commenter here. Um, the sheer volume of truly garbage art that will be produced into communism is going to be astounding and incredibly beautiful and also probably incredibly banal because like there will be masterpieces in a thousand dogs playing poker. Like, yep. <laughs> Like, I'm not one of these people who thinks, like, it's all going to be, like, socialist jumpsuit aesthetics. Like, my, you know, my, 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 one of my early comments, like, I've been saying this for 10 years, when I, when I woke up to this, you know, view of Marxism, and I came just kind of on my own, and then I was, then I went through the sectarian programming, and then I deprogrammed myself sectarianly, um, but, um, was the, this idea that, 
no, if you think about it, we're we're about unlocking freedom, not like socialism is actually about freedom, um, mm-hmm. a a more positive form of freedom, not having not being free to labor and pick which toil I have to do. Um, and I also like, I do think like they, there's, you know, there will be planning under socialism, but I also, am, I am somewhat hesitant of like a uniform singular planned economy. I'm actually, this is, this is kind of unique to my vision of communism, but that we would have multiple plannings emerging, um, and both comp and both socially competitive, but not overcompensation, right. but also, um, competitive over yeah. what's more effective. Yeah. Yeah, socially competitive, but not, but not um, on a survival level. So mm-hmm. competition is safe. Just like like when you establish schools, you want ideal, you want you want ideal um, conditions for people to learn, right? You want mm-hmm. competition with low, with low, um, with low material consequences. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll have a thousand W's. Um, but, but not bombing Iraq, painting weird shoes and, you know, working for part of the day. I mean, because when you think about the amount of productivity we've used to actually just do more work to produce more profits for what, like, like, like this is where, like, I always like mock uh, Maynard Keynes, Maynard Keynes, like our, Mm -hmm. our, our work day will get shorter because we just don't need to do it. I'm like, no, we're going to squeeze more productivity out of workers. Duh. Like, like, unless you entirely reorient the economy machines make work more like make work extend the work hours and the and contradiction and the will heighten right um but what do you think um, about george w bush he could have just been a painter there are many many historical tragedies that would have been avoided if you just let artists be artists yeah um this is why if I am, if there is ever a communist party, you should not vote for me because I'm a poet, and you should not trust me. You should let me let me educate people and um, and write poetry. You do not put me in charge of anything because I'm just saying Zizek's right. Us poets have a really bad track record of like killing a lot of people for aesthetic, well, like for weird as, reasons. As a Marxist varnist, I disagree. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um. A Marxist varnish can be in charge as long as that motherfucker's not a poet. <laughs> um, yeah, but, that's consistent. Uh, but but Marx, but like Marx, Varn should never be given power. You should people in power maybe should listen to me, but don't give me power. Like my, my friends, my friends will know. Like, yeah, every now and then I'm like, yeah, I understand why like Iron Felix existed because when oh, I get yeah. mad, I'm always just like. Why don't we? I don't know. Purge him, right? Um, and I'm like, no, Derek, you can't do that. You can't, do, like, you can't purge everybody. That's what. That's what. You know. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, listen to me, but don't give me power. Because if you give me power, you're gonna kick me out of republic. Because um, you can't trust poets, and you, that, that's probably true for artists. Probably true for YouTubers. Um, it's definitely true for podcasters. Oh yeah, like. Like let the let the Christmans of the world like work out theories and 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 do a lot of thinking, but dear God, don't give any of us power. I was, <laughs> I mean, Matt Christman. I was very, uh, I'm very pleased to hear he's like working on a book right now. Yeah, for I can't say more than it is probably for maybe us, but maybe not. Um, we'll see. Um, uh, but Christman's working on a book. Supposedly, one day we'll talk to each other. People want this to happen. I would pay uh, to see that. Um, but oh no, I just read a comment I shouldn't have read. Um, <laughs> we've been on an hour and a half. I tried to do my my wrap down, but you're very good at baiting me into talking. I gotta like think about this with interview subjects in the future. Are they better at interviewing than me? Will they let me interview myself? Well, it'll be even better <laughs> when I have you on my podcast. Oh, I'd be happy to come on and uh, actually be disciplined. When I go on other people's podcasts, I'm like, I want to talk about the thing they want me to talk about. Like, <laughs> uh, we'll have to think of a good topic. Yeah, um, I really, uh, I love. I, I wish there was more good scholarship on horror movies. I actually do feel like 
I'm getting more. I read horror scholarship, but I feel like I'm getting more from podcasts on that particular topic than I am from like film studies academia. But maybe I'm also not like it's probably all paywalled now and I don't get it any other way. That's the so, thing. Yeah. Um uh anyway, thank you for coming on, Dave. Um, thank you Thanks for, for having entertaining. Me. I hope anyone who's stayed on for all three and a half hours of this has gotten something out of the fact that we started talking about what we we're going to talk about and I think gave it up about an hour and a half in. Um, and uh, conspiracy theories and esotericism on the podcast. I'm going to have a lot of different guests come in. Um, some YouTubers. I'm going to actually go back to my old Scott, my old habit of like, I want to get talk to these random academics that no one else will talk to. Um, they did a book. I like 12 years ago and see if they'll come on a podcast on me with me. Hell yeah. Um, and I won't, these will not be, super regular because i also have to write a book but um my co-author on my book is working on her comps right now so knock on wood for her and so we're kind of on hiatus for that until for, uh, done with the her last comps. book yeah so she's doing her she's finishing her um her phd in social history and she's got to she's got to get her comps done so we had to like we got through the first we got through like decades um 60s through 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 early 70s with lash and now we're like okay you can go you know i, I gotta work on comps derek so so i don't have anyone who's like derek read lash so i'm reading lash but i'm also reading everything else i want to read and you can tell all my projects are stupid ambitious i'm always reading like five books at a time but i'll admit three of those books are comic books and then one of those books is going to be poetry and then two books of history or theory usually um it's more ambitious yeah. than me. I'm, I'm working on debt and I'm working on, like I said, uh, intro to the three volumes of Capital. Um, I mean, at least you picked a decent one. I think Heinrichs is at least philologically interesting. Um, yeah. Even if you don't totally agree with all of his interpretation. All right. Thanks for the people who um, we had some people who stayed for the entire thing. Yeah. Wow. Impressive. Um, for Varn Vlog, that's pretty good. Um, these would be coming out sporadically um i'll announce them usually with like 40 hours ahead of time but i don't i don't plan i don't really plan on doing much more than two or three varm blogs a week and one of these streaming sessions um, um and you guys can blame zero books for this i'm not gonna say why but uh you can blame zero books for this so um uh so uh Basically, I will say why, because that sounds conspiracy. Zero is is streamlining. That's not encrypted, yeah. Uh, Zero is streamlining its format to be more consistent. So, um, Doug was like, "Hey, can you do the twenty minute videos, and uh, we'll save um, interviews for the podcast, and let's stick to the parrot room format." So, please don't randomly interview people for me and not tell me, and just give it to me in the middle of the week. Um, and so I had a bunch of, I had a bunch, I have a bunch of those that I'm rolling out releasing. So I was also like, I'm just going to do this on my own now. Um, also, you know, they're going to be uncut and raw and, and, uh, probably really long. And so we'll see how it goes. All right. Take care. All right. Let me end broadcast.